Army Mental Tests, compiled and edited by Clarence S. Yelkham and Robert M. Yerkes, published with the authorization of the War Department. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Preface During the past few months, the Office of the Surgeon General of the Army and the National Research Council have been besieged with requests for information concerning the methods of psychological examining and for the printed materials used in the United States Army. To meet this demand, it has seemed advisable to prepare this little book, which, in addition to the examiner's guide, presents information concerning the results of psychological examining in the Army and indications of the possible uses of similar methods in education and industry. The book has been prepared under the editorial direction of Majors Clarence S. Yoakum and Robert M. Yerkes, who, in cooperation with other members of the psychological staff of the Surgeon General's Office, selected the various materials and decided about the mode of presentation. The editors are responsible for the material of certain of this chapter, and they have indicated the responsibility of others wherever possible. It has been arranged that the royalty from army mental tests shall be paid to the Treasurer of the National Research Council for the support of psychological research. The introductions originally printed in the Examiner's Guide for the Stanford Binet Scale and the Point Scale have been omitted from this volume because of copyright restrictions, but these materials are available in books previously published. A detailed and complete account of the methods and results of psychological examining in the Army is in course of publication in Memoirs of the National Academy of Sciences, Washington. The Editors End of Preface Introduction the human factors in most practical situations have been neglected largely because of our consciousness of ignorance and our inability to control them. Whereas engineers deal constantly with physical problems of quality, capacity, stress and strain, they have tended to think of problems of human conduct and experience either as unsolved or as insoluble. At the same time, there has existed a growing consciousness of the practical significance of these human factors and of the importance of such systematic research as shall extend our knowledge of them and increase our directive power. The great war from which we are now emerging into a civilization in many respects new has already worked marvellous changes in our points of view, our expectations and practical demands. Relatively early in this supreme struggle it became clear to certain individuals that the proper utilization of manpower and more particularly of mind or brain power would assure ultimate victory. The war demanded of us the speedy mobilization of our military machine and in addition to the organization and training of an immense supplementary armed force, the manufacture of ordnance and munitions of war in well nigh unimaginable quantities and construction of ships, motor transports and of varieties of rolling stock in vast numbers. All this had to be done in the least possible time. Never before in the history of civilization was brain, as contrasted with brawn, so important. Never before the proper placement and utilization of brain power so essential to success. Our War Department, nerved with exceptional risks by the stern necessity for early victory, saw and immediately seized its opportunity to develop various new lines of personal work. Among these is numbered the Psychological Service. Great will be our good fortune if the lesson in human engineering which the war has taught is carried over directly and effectively into our civil institutions and activities scarcely had war been declared by our country before the psychologists were brought together in a plan to make that professional knowledge technique and experience useful in the emergency in april nineteen seventeen the american psychological association appointed numerous committees to study the situation and prepare for action at the same time a committee for psychology was organized by the national research council thus it happened that from the outset american psychologists acted unitedly whereas their professional colleagues in france and great britain served individually wherever they could discover opportunity. The Committee for Psychology of the National Research Council has continued active over a period of nearly two years. Almost all of the psychological contributions which the United States has made to the war are either directly or indirectly due to the efforts or the support of this body. The work of which has been carried on through conferences, subcommittees or military appointees in the Army and the Navy. In order that the psychological examining of the soldier may be seen in its proper setting, the various chiefly significant lines of psychological service will be enumerated and chiefly characterized. 
Under the Adjutant General, the Committee on Classification of Personnel in the Army, which was originally organized by a group of psychologists who were at the time serving as members of the Committee for Psychology of the National Research Council or of Committees of the American Psychological Association for the Furtherance of the Military Service, developed and introduced throughout the Army methods of classifying and assigning enlisted men in accordance with their occupational and educational qualifications, and also methods of rating officers for appointment and promotion. The services of this committee to the work of which the War Department dedicated nearly a million dollars ultimately touched and more or less profoundly modified almost every important aspect of military personnel. To the Signal Corps, and subsequently to the Division of Military Aeronautics, psychological service was rendered in connection with measurements of the effects of high altitude and also in the selection and placement of men. Numerous important methods, new or adapted, were introduced in this service by groups of psychologists whose primary concern was improved placement and the proper utilization and protection of the flyer. The Committee for Psychology promoted effectively interest in the measures for the control and improvement of both military and civilian morale. The interest and persistent activity of its members ultimately resulted in the organization of a morale branch within the general staff of the Army. At various times, as many as 25 officers and enlisted men trained in military psychology were engaged in the conduct of practical morale work. For the Division of Military Intelligence, psychological methods were devised or adapted to assist in the selection, placement, and effective training of scouts and observers, and in addition, service of minor importance was rendered in numerous training camps. In response to requests from the Chemical Warfare Service, psychological problems presented by the gas mask were studied and the major recommendations resulting from these investigations were embodied in the latest improved form of mask. The psychological problems, either partially or completely solved for the Navy, are comprehended in the proper selection, placement and training of gunners, listeners and lookouts. Numerous situations were carefully analysed for the Navy, and methods and mechanical devices which have achieved extensive application and appreciation were developed. Within the medical department of the Army, a division of psychology was organized for the administration of mental tests to enlisted men and commissioned officers in accordance with the plans perfected during the summer of 1917. The history of this work will be briefly told as an introduction into the account of methods and results. The chief purpose of the psychological assistance originally offered to the medical department was a prompt elimination of recruits whose grade of intelligence is too low for satisfactory service. It was believed by psychologists assembled in conference that their profession is better prepared technically and by practical experience to measure intelligence than are members of the medical profession and that psychologists, therefore, should be able in the military emergency to render invaluable assistance to medical officers by supplying reliable measures of intelligence which might be used as partial basis for rejection or discharge. Thus, it was thought, the efficiency of the service might be considerably increased and the cost materially diminished. As it happens, the purposes of this service as actually developed differ radically from that originally proposed. Moreover, they serve to identify this work even more closely with the personal work of the Adjutant General's Office and of the General Staff than with anything in the Medical Department of the Army aside from neuropsychiatric work. To meet the prospective need of psychological assistance, a committee of seven experts in practical mental measurement was organized in the summer of 1917 and called together for the preparation or selection of suitable methods. This group of men worked almost continuously for a month, devising, selecting and adapting methods. Another month was spent in thoroughly testing the methods in military stations in order that their value might be definitely established before they should be recommended to the medical department of the army. The results were gratifying and the methods were therefore recommended to the Surgeon General of the Army in August 1917 and properly accepted for official trial. During October and November, they were applied in four cantonments, under conditions that could scarcely have been more unfavourable than the results which led the official medical inspector to formulate the following statements and recommendations. The purposes of psychological testing are a. to aid in segregating the mentally incompetent, b. to classify men according to their mental capacity, c. to assist in selecting competent men for responsible positions. In the opinion of this office, these reports, accompanying recommendation, indicate very definitely that the desiring results have been achieved. The success of this work in a large series of observations, some 5,000 officers and 80,000 men, 
makes it reasonably certain that similar results may be expected if the system be extended to include the entire enlisted and drafted personnel and all newly appointed officers. In view of these considerations, I recommend that all company officers, all candidates for officers' training camps, and all drafted and enlisted men be required to take the prescribed psychological tests. In January 1918, this new work of the medical department was extended in accordance with the above recommendation. Placing psychological examining in the medical department naturally caused certain difficulties of administration. The confusion of psychological work with neuropsychiatry was one of the first difficulties met. The administration of psychological examining by a medical officer increased the work of this officer and at the same time added to his staff a group of psychologists with whose work he was unfamiliar and who were perhaps more interested in establishing their particular examinations than in correlating their work with the work of the medical department. Notwithstanding these and many other difficulties which the new methods met, official inquiry into the results of the examining made in the latter part of November and the early part of December 1917 indicated that 75% of the officers who had become even slightly acquainted with the work favoured the continuation of psychological examining. The original purpose of the committee in the preparation of methods for intelligence testing were less important than the uses actually made of the results. It was the intention of the committee, as stated above, to prepare an examination that would indicate the drafted men who were too low grade mentally to make satisfactory privates in the army. It was desired also to indicate, if possible, those who were mentally unstable or who might prove incorrigible so far as army discipline was concerned. In addition, the committee hoped to be able to pick out exceptional types of men who could be used for special tasks that demanded a high degree of intelligence. In interesting contrast with these original purposes of mental examining stand the results actually achieved. 1. The assignment of an intelligence rating to every soldier on the basis of systematic examination. 2. The designation and selection of men whose superior intelligence indicates the desirability of advancement or special assignment. 3. The prompt selection and recommendation for development of battalions of men who are so inferior intellectually as to be unsuited for the regular military training. 4. The provision of measurements of mental ability which enable assigning officers to build organisations of uniform mental strength or in accordance with definite specifications concerning intelligence requirements. 5. The selection of men for various types of military duty or for special assignment, as for example, to military training schools, colleges, or technical schools. 6. The provision of data for the formation of special training groups within the regiment or battery in order that each man may receive instruction suited to his ability to learn. 7. The early discovery and recommendation for elimination of men whose intelligence is so inferior that they cannot be used to advantage in any line of military service. It is of course unfortunate, from the point of view of scientific research, that many lines of investigation indicated by these general results could not be carried out. The psychological service existed in the army for strictly practical purposes. The directors of the service emphasized continually the necessity for rendering immediate assistance in the organization of the army and the setting aside of all investigations which did not further this practical end. The results given in the following chapter are therefore based almost entirely on military needs and indicate the success of this service in the army. The more strictly scientific aspects of this type of examining can be considered in future studies when the practical aim is less insistent or can more readily be made subservient to scientific standards. End of preface and introduction. Chapter 1 of Army Mental Tests Compiled and edited by Clarence S. Yoakum and Robert M. Yerkes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Army Mental Tests, Chapter 1. Making the Tests. The origin of general intelligence tests is due to the genius of Alfred Binet. His investigations and early publications gave the stimulus to the development of mental tests for school children. He also did pioneer work in the study of the characteristics of the feeble-minded. Since his early work appeared in 1905, the volume of material has been extremely large. 
Numerous tests have been used in the schools and in psychological laboratories. Many of these have been standardized and have proved particularly useful in school and community surveys. Noteworthy advances have been made by psychologists in the United States. Three of the most important steps in individual testing are represented by the Goddard Revision of the Binet Scale, the Eriks Bridges Point Scale and the Stanford Revision of the Binet Scale. Whipple's Manual of Mental and Physical Tests conveniently presents the literature of tests and standards for many of them. Group methods of mental testing were foreshadowed by a few studies previous to the development of the army methods. These were scattering and had had no extensive use before 1917. The idea of examining children and others in groups, however, existed, and it was on the basis of these preliminary studies and the work in individual examining that the committee which met at Vernland felt that it could produce a group examination which would serviceably classify recruits for army purposes. Three or four of the members of this committee had had direct experience with group methods. The committee consisted of R. M. Yerkes, Chairman, W. V. Brigham, Secretary, H. H. Goddard, T. H. Haynes, L. M. Terman, G. M. Whipple, and F. L. Wells. Each of these men brought to the work of the committee a large amount of material which was sifted to produce the group test and individual examining materials of the first examiner's guide. Hundreds of tests already published were also available. The committee drew upon these published tests and upon the materials brought together by the members for the group methods and for the individual methods devised for the army. A complete group test, the work of A. S. Otis of Leland Stanford University, quite similar in form to that finally adopted by the army, was in manuscript. It also was drawn upon in making the army tests. It is not the purpose of this chapter to go into detail concerning the work of the committee in the preparation of the army mental tests, but it does seem worthwhile to call attention to certain principles that underlie the making of general intelligence tests and to suggest certain cautions in their use. The ease with which the army group tests can be given and scored makes it a dangerous method in the hands of the inexpert. It was not prepared for civilian use and is applicable only within certain limits to other uses than that for which it was prepared. In order to indicate this limited applicability, we shall quote here the criteria formulated and accepted by the committee before any work on the test was attempted. The test to be devised for army use, the committee believes should, first, be adaptable for group use in the examining of large numbers rapidly. Second, it should have a high degree of validity as a measure of intelligence. Third, the range of intelligence measured by the tests should be wide. That is, the test should be made difficult enough to measure the higher levels of intelligence and at the same time be an adequate measure of the extremely low levels that would probably be found in the army. Fourth, as far as possible, it should be arranged for objectivity of scoring and the elimination of personal judgment concerning correct answers. Thus, the results of scoring in one camp would be strictly comparable with those obtained in another. Fifth, the test should be so arranged that the scoring could be done rapidly and with the least chance of error. Also, this arrangement should be so simple that relatively inexpert assistance could be used in scoring the large numbers of papers. Sixth, there must be either different forms or alternative tests of equal difficulty to prevent coaching. Seventh, it was necessary also to obtain clues which would enable examiners to detect malingering in connection with the examination. Eighth, cheating must also be avoided. Ninth, the test must be made as completely independent of schooling and educational advantages as possible. Tenth, the arrangement should be such as to allow a minimum of writing and recording answers. Eleventh, the tests must consist of material which would arouse interest in the subjects. Twelfth, the different tests used should be arranged to yield an accurate measure of intelligence in a reasonably short time. With these criteria in mind, the committee set to work on the materials available to produce what is now known as the Army Mental Test. In the original series, there were 13 different tests. These were rated by the psychologists present on the basis of their validity as measures of intelligence. All other criteria mentioned were also taken into account. These tests were then given to selected groups and the results compared with the criteria laid down. As a result, certain tests were eliminated because they failed to meet the requirements. In connection with each of the tests finally selected, certain additional cautions are to be noted. In general, the battery of tests selected was composed of separate tests, no one of which exceeded a time limit of approximately five minutes. The number of items in each test and the time limits were so fixed that 5% or less in any average group 
would be able to finish the entire series of items in the time allowed. It was deemed advisable to have the directions for each test read aloud by the examiner and to have the subjects follow the reading of the directions. For each test a series of sample items correctly answered was given. In order to prevent coaching and cheating, alternative forms were prepared. Materials were gathered by the committee for ten of these alternative forms, but only five were finally printed. In making the alternative forms of the tests, approximately equal difficulty for the forms was desired. This was obtained by using the principle of random selection in preparing the items for each test. For example, if a test had 40 items and 10 forms were to be made, 400 items of the nature desired in the test were prepared. These were printed on separate slips of paper and shoveled. From this mass of 400 items were drawn the items for each form alternatively. The methods of scoring necessary for speed and accuracy were determined empirically after the first and second trials of the tests. Special methods of selecting the material for the items in each of the tests were used, and specific cautions were observed in the arrangements of the items in each. These need not be discussed here. As an example, however, of the care with which the tests were made, we may cite the procedure used in Test 7, known as the Analogies Test. Here, two words with a specific relation are given together with a third word, which bears that same relation to another word in a group of four words. This word in the group of four bears, as has been stated, the relation to the third word that holds for the first two. However, another word in this group of four words bears a relationship to the third word commonly known as the free association relationship. That is to say, if the third word is spoken to a listener who is asked to give the first word that occurs to him after hearing this word, the chances are high that he would give this second word as the free association word. The peculiar nature and difficulty of the test at once becomes apparent when this method of making it is known. In test 5, the disarranged sentence test, as in certain of the other tests, the chance order of true and false sentences was used. In other words, an equal number of true and false items was selected for any one form of this test. The sequence in which they appeared on the page was determined by tossing a coin. In addition to these special principles in making up the tests, the items were arranged as far as possible in the order of difficulty, the easier ones being placed first and the more difficult ones last. As stated above, the preliminary trials gave the basis for the revision and modification of the tests originally selected. After this revision and modification, ten tests remained. These ten tests were then given to approximately 5,000 men in the regular army and national guard, and in addition to a variety of subjects outside the army. This range of subjects includes inmates of institutions for the feeble-minded, members of officers' training schools and students in colleges and universities. The examination papers, just as the examinees had marked them, were sent to Columbia University, where a statistical group headed by Edward L. Thorndike studied the results of the test to check their validity, reliability, and significance. The technical methods used cannot be described here. Some of the more simple methods and checks, however, may be mentioned. A brief enumeration of these will indicate the laborious nature of the task of standardizing a test. Certainly, the usefulness of a test requires clear formulation and close study of the problem, painstaking fitting of the test to the conditions set, correct and proper, statistical studies of results, and, first and last, skill and originality in devising the form and content of the test itself. At the same time that these statistical investigations were being carried on, the tests were given to other subjects who had previously been examined by established methods of mental testing. Other measures of intelligence such as officers' ratings of soldiers of the National Guard and the regular army were obtained. Where school children or college students were examined, teachers' estimates of intelligence and college or school grades were used. The results of the army intelligence tests were then compared with these other measures of intelligence. In a group of tests, such as the army group examinations, each of which is made up of eight types of test, it is necessary to note the relations between the separate tests. If, for example, the relationship between two of the tests is very high, it is possible that the tests are repetitive and that one of them is unnecessary. On the other hand, an extremely low relationship between one of the tests and the total score might indicate that the test should be omitted because it adds little to the measure of intelligence yielded by the group of tests as a whole. The caution to be observed in this instance, or where a specific testing purpose is in view, is that the test may measure some ability of equal importance with the abilities measured by the other tests of the group. The relation of the group of tests to the independent measure of the trait in question constitutes the specific reason for keeping or rejecting a test which shows a low relationship to the total score.
Other things to be noted in measuring the usefulness of a particular test are the number of zero scores produced by the test, the time allowance, and the method of scoring. It is obvious, for example, that if 50% of the group tested, or even 20%, make zero scores, the test is unsatisfactory as a measure of a wide range of intelligence. It is also important to note whether most of the persons tested are given opportunity to exhibit their maximum ability in a test too short a time allowance may prevent some from reaching items of sufficient difficulty to test their ability. On the other hand, in preparing the army tests it was necessary to limit the time allowance in accordance with the practical situation. In scoring the tests, certain mathematical precautions are necessary. For instance, the test which offers only two alternatives will yield a high percentage of right scores by chance. To compensate for this, such a test may be scored right minus wrong. In addition, a considerable list of observations necessary in finally checking the validity of the army tests might be given. It was found that on the whole, the ten tests which constituted the examination known as examination A, forms A, B, C, D and E of the official army trial on the 4th of 1917 were fairly satisfactory measures of intelligence. The score distributions for each of the tests were good, that is, there were relatively few zero scores and a small percentage of the subjects could either finish or practically finish the tests in the time allowed. A study of the increase in incorrect answers in the upper range of items in each test also indicated that the tests approximated a measure of actual ability and were not merely testing speed in reading or thinking. There proved to be a regular gradation of the score distributions from the graduate students through the officers training school men, regular and national guard privates, down to the inmates of institutions for the feeble-minded. Comparison of the results of the tests which, with officers' ratings of their own men, showed a satisfactory degree of correspondence. On the whole, the tests graded the men as the officers estimated the value of these same men to the army. Repetition of the tests indicated that they had a fairly high degree of reliability. If a man did his best, the chances were that he would vary ten points or less in a second trial. The statistical results indicated further that for the entire group it was fairly safe to say that the men's true scores were not more than 15 points above or below the ones actually recorded. In this connection, it may be noted that the alpha examination, which is the one given in the examiner's guide included in this volume, shows an even higher reliability. The evidence indicates that the average scores due to accidental circumstances vary. For this examination, not more than 5 points up or down. Comparisons of the results of the tests, with schooling as reported by the person tested indicate that the tests are not merely a measure of schooling or of opportunity to attend school, but are actually a measure of native ability. All five forms of the group examination were used in the pre-official trial of the tests. The differences in forms were so slight as to indicate the success of the random method of selecting items. Form B proved more difficult than the other forms. The order of items was changed as a result of the trial in a few instances. One further question remained. How should the results of widely distributed testing of this sort be interpreted? In this connection, it may be emphasized again that the group examination used in the army was interpreted entirely in terms of military needs. Modifications made in the tests, such as scoring and weighing, were all intended to make it a better measure of ability in the army. This specialization of the group examinations for the army makes them less valuable in other fields. We have indicated above that the range of intelligence measured by the tests included distinctly feeble-minded persons as well as officers and graduate students. The assignment of letter grades to the score distributions was based upon this range. The scores were designated as A, B, C, D and E ratings. This division into five grades or ratings was considered sufficiently fine for the principal army uses. Subdivisions can be introduced to any extent desired. The alpha numerical score ranges from 0 to 212 points. In preparing distribution tables, scatter tables, and in all statistical calculations, 5 and 10 point groups or classes are used. For example, all scores are 55 to 59 points or 70 to 79 points inclusive form one group. Officers training school candidates and graduate students made as a rule A and B scores. Clerical assistants and men in the regular army who could handle the paperwork usually made grades in upper C or B. The average private scored C. Men who reported themselves as labourers fell in grade D, and privates who belonged to service organisations or who were relatively ineffective in the army, or men who were inmates of institutions for the feeble-minded, made scores in low D or E. The general intelligence test for literates covering a wide range of ability was prepared for its official trial in the manner described above. The need for haste in its construction made it important that a thorough study of the test in actual camp conditions be undertaken. This trial was made in four National Army cantonments, in the fall of 1917. 
Approximately 80,000 men were tested in this official trial of the methods. About 7,000 college, high school and elementary school students were also tested in order to check the army results. All of the data available from the official trial were then subjected to statistical treatment as a basis for revision of the tests. Psychologists from the camps and members of the original committee spent over two months in the study of results and in the revision of methods. From this work and the preliminary trial that followed the revision, the present methods were obtained. The group examination beta was prepared to enable examiners to make a rapid survey of the 30% who either could not read English or read it so slowly that they could not do themselves justice in the test for literates. The Stanford Binet and the Point Scale were adapted for army use at this time and the individual examination for foreigners and illiterates was prepared. The validity of the tests as measures of intelligence was checked against every available criterion, including officer ratings of men, army rank as an outcome of survival of the fittest, other kinds of intelligence scales, professional success, and ability to learn as evidenced by school standing. Not only has the scale as a whole been thus checked up, but also every one of the separate parts making up the scale. The correlations with other criteria of known validity were almost invariably high. The influence of literacy, repetition of the test, the physical condition of the examinee, and the personal equation of the examiner have all been carefully considered. The development of the beta test and of the performance test for the examination of the foreign speaking and illiterate presented special problems. The use of demonstration charts and pantomime to convey the instructions to the person being examined proves successful. The new method of test in the beta, using geometrical designs, mutilated pictures, etc., required different principles in its construction. The individual performance tests also involved additional and peculiar standards of construction and evaluation. The important purpose of these supplementary tests was, of course, to give to those handicapped by language difficulties a real opportunity to show their ability. In addition, two definite aims were planned in the use of all forms of testing. First, to point out the feeble-minded and those incapable of military service because of mental deficiency, and second, to find those of unusual or special ability. The arrangement of each test, in both group and individual examinations, was therefore checked against the scores of men in institutions for the feeble-minded. If no score had meant low mentality, the first task would have been solved, but we have shown that literacy was an important factor in the alpha test. The beta test practically eliminated this factor and was thus a step further in selecting those of low intelligence. To prove conclusively that a man was weak-minded and not merely indifferent or malingering, the performance test was added. The individual examinations as finally used in the army were, therefore, primarily checks on the group examinations. No person was reported as feeble-minded until a detailed individual psychological examination had been made. Many cases of mental disorder were discovered and referred to the psychiatrist for examination. Disciplinary cases referred to the psychologist were always given individual examinations, as were referred cases of men having difficulty with drill or those who failed to improve in the YMCA schools and elsewhere. A detailed statement of how these tests are made is impractical here. Most of the methods used in the Army and given in the Examiner's Guide are described in journals and in the literature of mental tests. The results of their use are indicated by the numbers of examinations made and by the totals of low-grade cases found. The instructions for giving the tests are perhaps more essential in individual examination than they are in the group examinations. Again, the detailed cautions have been presented in the literature of mental tests and need not be repeated at this point. End of chapter 1「Chapter 2 of Army Mental Tests」by Clarence Yalcom and Robert Yerkes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 2 Methods and Results After a preliminary trial in four continents, psychological examining was extended by the War Department to the entire Army, excepting only field and general officers. To supply the requisite personnel, a school for training in military psychology was established in the medical officers' training camp, Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. Approximately 100 officers and more than 300 enlisted men received training at this special school. On November 11th, 1918, the psychological personnel consisted of about 120 officers and 350 enlisted men. Over 500 additional clerks were used in the examining service in the 35 different camps 
in which psychological examining had been established. The Army Intelligence Examination had been given to 1,726,966 men. Of these, 41,000 were officers. Approximately 83,000 individual examinations had been given. Over 7,800 men had been recommended for immediate discharge. 10,014 had been recommended for labor battalions or other service organizations. 9,487 had been recommended for development battalions for further observation and preliminary training. Nearly 30% of the 1,556,011 men for whom statistics are available were found to be unable to read and understand newspapers and write letters home, and were given a special examination prepared for literates. The general classification of the men proceeded as rapidly as they reported to camp. Men qualified to be non-commissioned officers and candidate officers on the basis of satisfactory intelligence scores were pointed out within 48 hours of their arrival. By this time, the general usefulness of psychological examining was no longer seriously questioned, and it had become necessary for the psychologists of a camp to emphasize continually that the methods were intended as a measure of only one of the essential qualities of a soldier. A few quotations from the statements of officers will indicate their general attitude and typical ways in which the results were used in training men and in selecting candidates for the officers' training schools. Officers and men should be given a psychological examination as a matter of routine. The results of the psychological examinations are fully borne out by actual observation of the abilities and the capacity of various officers in the performance of duties assigned to them. I do not mean by this that the tests are an absolute gauge but I do mean that they are an absolute guide, and that given the practical tests, we are enabled to arrive at the best possible determination of ability to meet the requirements of the service. The subject of psychology in its relation to military efficiency is an entirely new one, and the War College Division approached it with a good deal of doubt as to its value. A very thorough study of the report submitted, however, has firmly convinced it that this examination will be of great value in determining the possibilities of newly drafted men and all candidates for officers' training camps. At first, due to the innate conservatism of line and even of medical officers, his, the psychological examiner's, task was a rather uphill one, but now, due to his own energy and tact, and to the thoroughness and honesty of his work, practically all officers have been convinced of its practical value and unique assistance in rating, sorting, and disposing of the diverse kinds of men, as well as officers who pass through such a camp. I consider such an expert and his speciality among the most useful aids in the scientific and non-wasteful utilization of manpower. I consider the psychological service of a special value in this camp, which is devoted to the elementary training of recruits for field artillery. The forms, filled out by applicants, were arranged in the order of the psychological mark, and all applicants of Class A were gone over with the view of finding out if there were any who, because of a specific statement of the company commander, should be thrown out without further examination. There were almost none of these. The same thing was done with all of Class B. The Class C applicants were then gone over with the view of seeing if there were any who, notwithstanding their low psychological mark, should nevertheless be considered because of the specific statement of the company commander. There were very few of these. The psychological examination of these men has been a great aid to me as commanding officer of the school, not only in the final summing up of their qualifications for an officer's commission, but also during their stay at the school in working out the reasons for their apparent efficiency. It is recommended that in the future all candidates for officers' training schools be sent first before a psychological board and that the results of this examination be a determining factor in their entrance to the school. I consider it highly desirable to use psychological ratings in the selection of all applicants for the officers' training camp. It is doubtful whether applicants should be admitted to the school who have not, according to the psychological examinations, made a score equivalent to high average intelligence. C+. Plus. Intelligence ratings should receive primary consideration, and all other important factors secondary consideration. In very exceptional and rare cases, it is possible that this order of consideration may be reversed. We find the psychological ratings more reliable than any other information. Above all else, an officer should have a high degree of intelligence, and when this is combined with an excellent physical record, leadership, etc., we have the type desired for a commissioned officer. The Board of Officers, charged with the duties of examining candidates for the officer's training school, regard the psychological ratings 
as the one best factor of the various factors which determine a candidate's qualification for entry to said school. Concurring in the opinion of the commanding officer of the training school, this camp, the above board of officers, hold that all candidates should have not less than a high average intelligence rating, C+, to qualify for entry to training schools, except in rare and exceptional cases in which other factors are extremely favourable. It is the unanimous opinion of this board that the intelligence rating is the most reliable index, in that a quantitative statement is available and in that rough observation is effectively checked. The psychological rating is, therefore, considered of primary importance. From my experience in different camps, I am of the opinion that enlisted men who rate below the A and B classes by the psychological test should not be considered as candidates for the officers' training schools. All enlisted men sent to officers' training schools from this camp are inspected as to their military appearance and bearing and their knowledge of the elementary duties of a soldier. They are given a physical examination, a mental examination, and the psychological examination. If they do not rate A or B in this examination, they are rejected. The methods originally prepared for use in the army were subjected to repeated revisions in the light of results for increase in reliability and military value. The procedure finally adopted and used throughout the army consists of two chief types of examination, the group examination and the individual examination. The former was necessitated by the demand for speed of examination and report, the latter by the desire for reliability and fairness to the individual. Of group examinations, there are two varieties used in this army. The one for men who can read and write English fairly well, literates, known as alpha. The other for men who are unable to read and write English well, illiterates, known as beta. The individual examination includes three varieties developed, as were the group examinations, to suit different types of subjects. They are 1. The point scale examination, 2. The Stanford Binet examination, and 3. The performance scale examination. Both the point scale and the Stanford Binet are used in the Army in three forms. A. As complete scales for literate subjects. B. As abbreviated scales for literate subjects. C. As specially adapted scales for relatively illiterate subjects. These two types of examination, the point scale and Stanford Binet, are used as alternates, the examiner selecting in accordance with his preference. For the examination of foreign and illiterate men who can neither read nor write English and of whom many speak and understand it very imperfectly, the special form of examination known as a performance scale has been developed and is effectively used. Examination Alpha consists of eight tests described by title as follows. Test 1. Directions or Commands Test Test 2. Arithmetical Problems Test 3. Practical Judgment Test 4. Synonym Antonym Test 5. Disarranged Sentences Test 6. Number Series Completion Test 7. Analogies Test 8. General Information Of this method, men are examined in groups as large as 500. Every man is supplied with a pencil and an examination blank. He then, under military discipline, follows directions to the best of his ability. The examination requires approximately 50 minutes and demands almost no writing since responses are indicated by underscoring, crossing out, or checking. The examination papers are quickly scored by means of stencils and mental ratings recorded for prompt report. To avoid, within reasonable limits, the risk of coaching, several duplicate forms of this examination have been made available. Each test of examination alpha consists of a number of parts arranged in order of difficulty from low to high. It is therefore possible for low-grade subjects to make a start on each test, and at the same time, practically impossible for highly intelligent subjects to complete the test within the time allowed. The tests are varied in character and undoubtedly sample the most important types of intellectual process. Examination beta consists of seven tests, listed thus by titles. Test 1, maze test. Test 2, cube analysis. Test 3, XO series. Test 4. Digit Symbol Test 5. Number Checking Test 6. Pictorial Completion Test 7. Geometrical Construction This examination, which was devised after Alpha had been put into use to meet an unexpected demand for the examination of subjects of low literacy and extreme unfamiliarity with English, is in effect, although not in strictness, test for test. Alpha translated into pictorial form so that pantomime and demonstration may be substituted for written and oral directions. Beta may be given successfully to men who neither speak nor understand English. 
examinations alpha and beta are so constructed and administered as to minimize the handicap of men who because of foreign birth or lack of education are little skilled in the use of english these group examinations were originally intended and are now definitely known to measure native intellectual ability they are to some extent influenced by educational acquirement but in the main the soldier's inborn intelligence and not the accidents of environment determine his mental rating or grade in the army like alpha examination beta requires about fifty minutes and the papers are scored by the use of stencils both alpha and beta yield numerical scores or intelligence scores which for practical military purposes are translated into letter grades the several letter grades used in the army with their score equivalents and appropriate definitions are presented in the following table table is displayed on the page with four columns intelligence grade the definition the score alpha and the score beta e grade was reserved for men who are recommended for rejection discharge developmental battalion or service organization all men deemed satisfactory for regular military duty were graded d minus or higher neither the point scale nor the stanford binet scale need be described in detail since both are widely known and adequate descriptions are available the military adaptations of the scales may prove useful in various civil situations but because of copyright restrictions they are not reproduced in this volume the several procedures of individual examining have played a most important role in the military service and the examiner who lacks familiarity with them and reasonable skill in their application and the interpretation of their results is ill prepared for psychological military service the army performance scale cannot be adequately described by a reference since it is in the main a product of military experience and effort it consists of ten tests the titles of which fairly well suggest their nature test one the ship test test two mannequin and feature profile test three cube imitation test four cube construction test five form board test six designs test seven digit symbol test eight maze test nine picture arrangement test ten picture completion as in the case of group examinations alpha and beta so also in that of the several forms of individual examination numerical scores for subjects were secured which could be translated into letter grades the general procedure of examining which was developed to meet military requirements is briefly describable as follows a group of draftees the size of which is determined by the seating capacity of examining room it varies from one hundred to five hundred men is reported to the psychological examining building for mental test the first essential step is the segregation of the illiterates this is accomplished by having all men who cannot read and write their own letters and those who have not proceeded beyond the fifth grade in school step out of the original group the remaining men are sent to the alpha room naturally among them are likely to be several who will subsequently have to take the beta examination the illiterates are sent directly to the beta room men who fail in alpha are sent to beta in order that injustice by reason of relative unfamiliarity with english may be avoided men who fail in beta are referred for individual examination by means of what may appear to be the most suitable and altogether appropriate procedure among the varied methods available this reference for careful individual examination is yet another attempt to avoid injustice either by reason of linguistic handicap or accidents incident to group examining it is to be emphasized that the interests of the individual who is either in the army or in process of being accepted for military service are safeguarded by a system of three types of examination which serve as the sieves every soldier is required to take at least one examination men who are of low mentality or who are of foreign birth or for other reasons illiterate and those who exhibit marked peculiarities of behavior may be required to take either two or three examinations before the psychological report can be completed despite the necessity for haste in which some instances compelled small examining staffs to grade and report on as many as two thousand soldiers per day the army mental test work has been done with an average thoroughness and degree of reliability which would do credit to any school system or other civil institution when psychological examining was originally accepted by the medical department for officer trial there was extreme and widely prevalent scepticism even among psychologists themselves concerning the reliability of the measurements of intelligence which could be secured and still more concerning their practical value to the army 
the measures of reliability or validity of army methods of mental measurement which have been obtained during the past eighteen months are therefore quite as important as a partial basis for a safe opinion concerning the significance of this service as are the evidences of practical value which have accumulated effort will be made to present as adequately as is possible within brief compass samples of both kinds of measure first reliability may be considered for examination alpha the probable error of the score is approximately five points this is one-eighth of the standard deviation of the score distribution for unselected soldiers the reliability coefficient is approximately point nine five alpha yields correlations with other measures of intelligence as follows one with officers ratings of their men point five zero to point seven zero two with stanford binet measurements point eight zero to point nine zero three with Trebu B and C completion tests combined, 0.72. 4. With examination beta, 0 0.80. 5. With composite of alpha, beta and Stanford Bennett, 0 0.94. 6. In the case of school children, alpha measurements correlate with A. Teacher's ratings, 0 0.67 to 0.82. B. School marks, 0 0.50 to 0 0.60. C. School grade location of 13 and 14 year old pupils, 0.75 to 0.91. D. Age of pupils, 0.83. Footnote. Chiefly because the relatively narrow age range, the correlation of alpha score with the age of recruits is practically zero. Results for examination beta correlate with alpha, 0 0.80, with Stanford Binet, 0 0.73, and composite of alpha, beta, and Stanford Binet, 0.91. Results of repetition of the Stanford Binet examination in case of school children correlate 0.94 to 0.97. The abbreviated form of the Stanford Binet scale consisting of only two sets per year extensively used in the Army correlates 0.92 with results for the entire scale. Reliability coefficients for results of point scale examination closely approximate those for the Stanford Binet scale. The several tests of the performance scale taken separately correlate with the Stanford Binet measurements 0.48 to 0.78. Five of the ten tests of the performance scale yield a total score which correlates 0.84 with Stanford Binet results. It is definitely established that examination alpha measures literate men very satisfactorily, considering the time required for mental ages above 11 years. Estimation beta is somewhat less accurate than alpha for the higher ranges of intelligence. There are convincing evidences that some men are not fairly measured by either alpha or beta and that the provision of careful individual examination for men who fail in beta is therefore of extreme importance. There follows a brief statistical summary of results of individual examining in the army and a discussion of military applications and evidence of practical value. Between April 27 and November 30, 1918, 7,749 men, 0.5%, were reported for discharge by psychological examiners because of mental inferiority. The recommendations for assignment to labor battalions because of low-grade intelligence number 9,871, 0.6%. For assignment to development battalions in order that they might be more carefully observed and given preliminary training to discover, if possible, ways of using them in the army, 9,432 men, 0.6% were recommended. During this same six-month interval, there were reported 4,744 men with mental age below seven years, 7,762 between seven and eight years, 14,566 between eight and nine years, 18,581 between nine and ten years. This gives a total of 45,653 men under ten years mental age. It is extremely improbable that many of these individuals were worth what it cost the government to maintain, equip and train them for military service. The psychological rating of a man was reported promptly to the personal adjutant and to the company commander. In addition, all low-grade cases and men exhibiting peculiarities of behaviour were reported also to the medical officer. The mental rating was thus made available for use in connection with rejection or discharge. The assignment of men to organisations and their selection for special tasks the mental ratings were used in various ways by commanding officers to increase the efficiency of training and to strengthen organizations by improved placement. It was repeatedly stated and emphasized by psychological examiners that a man's value to the service should not be judged by his intelligence alone, but that instead, 
temperamental characteristics, reliability, ability to lead, and to carry on, under varied conditions, should be taken into account. Even after the feasibility of securing a fairly reliable measure of every soldier's intelligence or mental alertness had been demonstrated, it remained uncertain whether these measurements would correlate positively with military value to a significant degree to render them useful. Data which have become available during the past year settle this question definitely by indicating a relatively high correlation between officer judgments of military value and the intelligence rating. A description and explanation of the letter ratings used by psychological examiners were handed to each officer who received the scores of recruits. Directions for the use of the ratings were also supplied. Quotations from Army Mental Tests will indicate the nature of these explanations and directions. In explanation of letter ratings, the rating a man earns furnishes a fairly reliable index of his ability to learn, to think quickly and accurately, to analyse a situation, to maintain a state of mental alertness, and to comprehend and follow instructions. The score is little influenced by schooling. Some of the highest records have been made by men who had not completed the 8th grade. The meaning of the letter ratings is as follows. A equals very superior intelligence. This grade is ordinarily earned by only 4 or 5% of the draft quota. The A group is composed of men of marked intellectuality. A men are of high officer type when they are also endowed with leadership and other necessary qualities. B equals superior intelligence. B intelligence is superior but less exceptional than that represented by A. The rating B is obtained by 8 to 10 soldiers out of 100. The group contains many men of the commissioned officer type and a large amount of non-commissioned officer material. C plus equals high average intelligence. This group includes 15 to 18 percent of all soldiers and contains a large amount of non-commissioned officer material, with occasionally a man whose leadership and power to command fit him for commissioned rank. C equals average intelligence. It includes about 25 percent of soldiers. Excellent private type with a certain amount of fair non-commissioned officer material. C minus equals low average intelligence. This group includes about 20%. Although below average in intelligence, C- men are usually good privates and satisfactory in work of a routine nature. D equals inferior intelligence. It includes about 15% of soldiers. D men are likely to be fair soldiers, but they are usually slow in learning and rarely go above the rank private. They are short on initiative and so require more than the usual amount of supervision. Many of them are illiterate or foreign. D minus and E. Very inferior intelligence. This group is divided into two classes. 1. D minus. Men who are very inferior in intelligence but are considered fit for regular service. And 2. E men. Those whose mental inferiority justifies their recommendation for development of battalion, special service organization, rejection or discharge. The majority of D minus and E men are below 10 years in mental age. The immense contrast between A and D- intelligence is shown by the fact that men of A intelligence have the ability to make a superior record in college or university, while D- men are of such an inferior mentality that they are rarely able to go beyond the third or fourth grade of the elementary school, however long they attend. In fact, many D- and E men are of the moron grade of feeble-mindedness. B intelligence is capable of making an average record in college. C plus intelligence cannot do so well, while mentality of the C grade is rarely capable of finishing a high school course. Concerning directions for the use of intelligence ratings, in using the intelligence ratings, the following points should be borne in mind. 1. The mental tests are not intended to replace other methods of judging a man's value to the service. It would be a mistake to assume that they tell us unfailably what kind of soldier a man will make. They merely hope to do this by measuring one important element in a soldier's equipment, namely intelligence. They do not measure loyalty, bravery, power to command, or the emotional traits that make a man carry on. However, in the long run these qualities are far more likely to be found in men of superior intelligence than in men who are intellectually inferior. Intelligence is perhaps the most important single factor in military efficiency, apart from physical fitness. 2. Commissioned officer material is found chiefly in the A and B groups. Although, of course, not all high school men have other qualifications necessary for officers, 
Men below C plus should not be accepted as students in officers' training schools unless they possess exceptional power of leadership and ability to command. 3. Since more than one-fourth of enlisted men rate as high as C+, plus, there is rarely justification for going below this grade in choosing non-commissioned officers. This is especially important in view of the likelihood of promotion from non-commissioned to commissioned rank. Even apart from consideration of promotion, it is desirable to avoid the appointment of mentally inferior men below C as non-commissioned officers. Several careful studies have shown that C- and D sergeants and corporals are extremely likely to be found unsatisfactory. The fact that a few make good does not justify the risk taken in their appointment. 4. Men below C+, plus are rarely equal to complicated paperwork. 5. In selecting men for tasks of special responsibility, the preference should be given to those of highest intelligence rating, who also have the other necessary qualifications. If they make good, they should be kept on the work or promoted. If they fail, they should be replaced by men next on the list. To aid in selecting men for occupational assignment, extensive data have been gathered on the range of intelligence scores found in various occupations. This material has been placed in the hands of personal officers for use in making assignments. It is suggested that those men who have an intelligence rating above the average in an occupation should be the first to be assigned to meet the needs of, for that occupation. After that, men with lower ratings should be considered. 6. In making assignments from the depot brigade to permanent organisations, it is important to give each unit its proportion of superior, average and inferior men. If this is left to chance, there will inevitably be wink links in the army chain. Exception to this rule should be made in favour of certain arms of the service which require more than the ordinary number of mentally superior men. For example, signal corps, machine gun, field artillery and engineers. These organisations ordinarily have about twice the usual proportion of A and B men and very much less than the usual proportion of D and D- minus men. The first two columns in the following table illustrate the distribution of intelligence ratings typical of infantry regiments and also the extreme difference in the mental strength of organisations which are built up without regard to intelligence ratings. The last column to the right shows the balanced distribution of intellectual strength which might have been obtained in each of these two regiments. A table is displayed on the page with five columns descending, weighted with intelligence rating, interpretation, two actual distributions, first regiment and second regiment, and a balanced distribution. Unless intelligence is wisely distributed, certain regiments and companies will take training much more slowly than others and thus delay the program for the whole organization. 7. D and D- men are rarely suited for tasks which require special skill, resourcefulness or sustained alertness. It is also unsafe to expect D, D- or E men to read or understand written directions. 8. Only high school men should be selected for tasks which require quick learning or rapid adjustments. 9. It should not be supposed that men who receive the same mental rating are necessarily of equal military worth. A man's value to the service should not be judged by his intelligence alone. 10. The intelligence rating is one of the most important aids in the rapid sorting of the masses of men in the depot brigade. In no previous war, has so much depended on the prompt and complete utilisation of the mental ability of the individual soldier. It is important, therefore, that the psychological ratings be regularly used as an aid in the selection, adjustment and classification of men. The various figures which follow are presented not as a summary of the results of psychological examining in the army, but instead as samples of these results, the chief value of which is to indicate their principal relationships and practical values. The sample distribution curves of Figure 1 indicate the value of mental ratings for the identification and segregation of differences. Moreover, within the officer group itself, significant differences appear for different branches of the service. The relation of success or failure in officers' training schools to intelligence ratings is exhibited by Figure 2, in which it is to be noted that elimination through failure in the school increases rapidly for ratings below C+. Of men rating above C+, 8.65% were eliminated. Of those below C+, 58.27%. The data for this figure were obtained 
from the three schools with a total enrollment of 1,375 men. Similarly, figure 3 shows the relation between success or failure in non-commissioned officers' training schools and intelligence ratings. The elimination increases rapidly for grades below C+. Of men rating above C, only 18.49% were eliminated. Of men rating below C, 62.41%. The results presented in this figure were obtained from four schools with a total enrollment of 1,458 men. Increasingly extensive and effective use has been made of the psychological rating as an aid in the selection of men for officers' training schools, non-commissioned officers' training schools, other lines of training or service which require special ability. It has been convincingly demonstrated that the data of psychological examinations can readily be used to diminish the necessary elimination during training and thus to increase the efficiency of the schools. The extreme difference in the intellectual status of army groups are fairly indicated by figure 4, which presents the data for groups whose military importance cannot readily be overemphasized. Roughly, the groups in the upper half of the figure are important because of their relatively high intelligence and the mental initiative demanded for success, whereas those in the lower half of the figure are important because of poor intelligence and relative inefficiency or uselessness. Figure 4 is displayed on the page. Proportion of low, average and high grade men in typical groups. These results suggest that if military efficiency alone were to be considered, the army would undoubtedly gain largely by rejecting all D- and E men. This procedure would greatly lessen the group of disciplinary causes so troublesome and costly in the military organization, and also the group which in the figure is distributed among ten poorest privates, men of low military value and unteachable men. Numerous varieties of evidence indicate the extreme military importance of the prompt recognition of the low-grade men. The percentages of men ranking below the average in psychological examinations are notably large for the disciplinary group. Men having difficulties in drill, men reported as unteachable, and men designated by their officers as poorest from the standpoint of military usefulness. The comparison of Negro with white recruits reveals markedly lower mental ratings for the former. A further significant difference based on geographical classification has been noted in that the northern Negroes are mentally much superior to the southern. The relation between officers' judgments of the value of their men and intelligence ratings is exhibited in somewhat different ways by figures 5 to 7. Thus the median scores for five groups of privates arranged in order of military value from very poor to best are presented in figure 5. The total number of individuals in the group is 374. The men were selected from 12 different companies, approximately 30 men in each company being ranked by an officer in serial order from best to poorest. The rank order for each company was then correlated by the psychological examiner with the rank order supplied by psychological examination. In 7 of the 12 companies, the correlations ranged from 0.64 to 0.75. The average correlation was 0.536. These correlations are high, considering the large number of factors which may influence a man's value to the service. The median score for the very poor group at figure 5 is 28 points in an examination whose maximal score is 212 points. By contrast with this, the median score of the best group of privates is 99 points. The commanding officers of 10 different organizations representing various arms of the service in a certain camp were asked to designate 1. the most efficient men in their organizations, 2. the men of average ability, and 3. the men so inferior that they are barely able to perform their duties. The officers of these organizations had been with the men from 6 to 12 months and knew them exceptionally well. The total number of men rated was 965, about equally divided among best, average and poorest. After the officers' ratings had been made, the men were given the usual psychological test. Comparison of the test results with officers' ratings showed a. that the average score of the best group was approximately twice as high as the average score of the poorest group. b that of men testing below C-70% were classed as poorest, and only 4.4% as best. C. That of men testing above C+, 15% were classed as poorest, and 55.5% as best. D. That the man who tests above C+, is about 14 times as likely to be classed as best as a man who tests below C-. E. 
that the percent classed as best in the various groups increased steadily from 0% in D to 57.7% in A, while the percent classed as poorest decreased steadily from 80% in D to 11.5% in A. Figure 5 is displayed on the page. Median intelligence scores by points of groups designated as best, good, fair, poor, and very poor in military value. In an infantry regiment of another camp were 765 men, regulars, who had been with their officers for several months. The company commanders were asked to rate these men as 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 according to practical soldier value, 1 being highest and 5 lowest. The men were then tested with the following results. A. Of 76 men who earned grade A or B, none was rated 5 and only 9 were rated 3 or 4. B. Of 238 D and D- men, only 1 received the rating 1 and only 7 received a rating of 2. C. Psychological ratings and ratings of company commanders were identical in 49.5% of all cases. There was agreement within one step in 88.4% of cases, and disagreement of more than two steps in only 0.7% of cases. Figure 6 exhibits a striking contrast in the intelligence status and distribution of the best and poorest privates. The personal judgment data for this figure were obtained from 60 company commanders who were requested to designate their 10 best and their 10 poorest privates. Of the poorest, 57.5% graded D or D-, minus, less than 3% graded A or B. The results suggest that intelligence is likely to prove the most important single factor in determining a man's value to the military service. In one training camp, excellent opportunity was offered to compare a group of soldiers selected on the basis of low military value with a complete draft quota. In the low value group, there were 147 men. In the complete draft quota, 12,341 men. The distribution of intelligence ratings for these two military groups appear as figure 7, from which it is clear that if all men with intelligence ratings below C- had been eliminated, the low value group would have been reduced by at least half. In a certain training camp, 221 inapt soldiers belonging to a Negro regiment of pioneer infantry were referred by their commanding officer for special psychological examination. Nearly one half, 109, of these men were found to have mental ages of seven years or less. The army nevertheless had been attempting to train these men for military service. In justice to the psychological service, it should be stated that these Negroes had been transferred from camps where there were no psychological examiners. For this reason, they had not been examined before being assigned to an organization for regular training. In another instance, some 306 soldiers from organizations about to be sent overseas were designated by their commanding officers as unfit for foreign service. They were referred for psychological examination, with the result that 90% were discovered to be 10 years or less in mental age, and 80% 9 years or less. It has been discovered that when soldiers are assigned to training units without regard to intelligence, Extreme inequalities in the mental strength of companies and regiments appear. This fact is strikingly exhibited by figures 8 and 9, of which the former shows the proportion of high grade and of illiterate or foreign soldiers in the various companies of an infantry regiment. Figure 8 is displayed on the page, inequality of companies in an infantry regiment. The list of companies is displayed across the page in alphabetical order, and the percent rated A or B in columns above, and percent illiterate or foreign in columns below. Compare, for example, the intelligence status of C and E companies. The former happens to have received only 3% of A and B men, along with 38% of illiterates and foreigners. The latter received, by contrast, 29% of high-grade men, with only 9% of men who are, as a rule, difficult to train. It is needless to attempt to emphasize the military importance of this condition. The tasks of the officers of these two companies are wholly incomparable, but more serious even than the inequalities in response to training are the risks of weak points in the army chain as a result of such random or unintelligent assignment. Naturally enough, the officers of the army were quick to appreciate the disadvantages of a method of assigning recruits which permits such extreme inequalities in mental strength to appear and persist. They promptly demanded the reorganization of improperly constituted units an assignment in accordance with intelligence specifications so that the danger of weakness in the chain and of extreme difference in rapidity of training should be minimized. Figure 9 is also displayed on the page, Inequality of Regiments. 
that serious inequalities existed in regiments as well as in smaller units prior to assignment on the basis of intelligence is proved by the data in figure nine which pictures the differences found in four infantry regiments and three regiments of field artillery following the demonstration of the value of psychological ratings in connection with the assignment the experiment was tried in various training camps of classifying men in accordance with intelligence for facilitation of training to this end a and b grade men were placed in one training group c plus c and c minus men in another and d and d minus men in a third the three groups were then instructed and drilled in accordance with their ability to learn thus delay in the progress of high grade men was avoided and the low grade soldiers were given special instruction in accordance with their needs and capacity the marked differences in the mental strength of groups in different officers training schools as shown by figure ten for the eighteen schools of this figure the proportion of a grades varies from sixteen point six per cent to sixty two point four per cent the proportion of a and b grades combined from forty eight point nine per cent to ninety three point six per cent and the proportion of grades below c plus from zero to seventeen point nine per cent since it is unusual for a man with an intelligence rating below c plus to make a satisfactory record in an officer's training school it is clear that the pedagogic treatment of these several student groups should differ more or less radically and that elimination must vary through a wide range if the several schools are to graduate equally satisfactory groups of officers figure ten is displayed on the page inequality of mental strength in eighteen officers training schools fourth series total enrollment nine thousand two hundred and forty far more important than the contrast in student officers training groups noted above are the differences in the intelligence status of officers in different arms of the service as revealed by psychological examining figure eleven exhibits the data obtained for several groups the variations are extreme and seemingly unrelated to the requirements of the service medical officers for example show a relatively large percentage of men rating c plus or below whereas engineering officers head the list with relatively few men whose intelligence is rated below B. There is no obvious reason for assuming that the military duties of an engineer demand higher intelligence or more mental alertness than do those of the medical officer, since it is improbable that any arm of the service possesses more intelligence than can be used to advantage. The necessary inference that is certain arms would benefit by the elimination of low-grade men and the substitution of officers with better intellectual ability. Table 1 summarizes the general classification obtained by the psychological examination. The column headed White Draft is a random sampling of the 1,726,000 men examined. Figure 11 is displayed on the page. Intelligence of officers in different arms of the military service. The graph lists a series of professions with engineers, artillery, sanitary corps, field signal battalions, machine gun battalions, infantry, Quartermaster Corps, Medical Corps, Dental Corps, Veterinary Corps. They are also graded with below B, B and A by percentiles. The column headed recruits is a small group, brought out by the holler of sorting, no longer the depot brigade, but not yet assigned to regular organizations. Privates designates a random selection of men reported as being in named organizations, such as infantry, artillery, machine gun, etc. The other columns are self explanatory. They do not represent exactly the same method of sampling, but are clearly typical of the differences revealed by other methods of sampling described and represented in the figures above. The group headed Surgeons includes all classes of surgeons. Medical officers are included in the percentiles given, with the medical officers omitted practically no correlation with rank of peers. The medical officers taken alone show a high correlation with rank. It has been suggested this represents the professional grading that is already being made in civil life figure 12 presents the percentages of table 1 in graphic form the different grades and ranks are shown according to the letter grade classification given in the table the dividing line is placed between c plus and b further evidence indicates that the tests prophecy success in field operations when the classification made by them is compared with total value to the service after a year of training and actual fighting the correspondence is still positive and an average statistical prophecy of attainment exists the degree of practical success in the application of such a measure may well be considered one of the major achievements of the war end of chapter two
Chapter 3, Section 1 of Army Mental Tests. Compiled and edited by Clarence S. Yoakum and Robert M. Yerkes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information on volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 3 Examiner's Guide for Psychological Examining in the Army. Directions for Giving the Army Mental Tests. Prepared especially for military use by the Subcommittee on Methods of Examining Recruits of the Psychology Committee of the National Research Council. Revised by direction of the Surgeon General of the Army and printed by the Medical Department, USA, September 1917. Second Revision, July 1918. 1. Introductory Statement 1. Purposes of Psychological Examination A. To classify soldiers according to their mental ability thus supplementing personal records of occupational qualifications and assisting with assignment in the army. b. To supply a mental rating for each soldier, which shall assist personal officers in building organizations of equal or of appropriate mental strength. c. To assist regimental company and medical officers by careful examination and report on men who are not responding satisfactorily to training or are otherwise troublesome. d to assist officers of development battalion with classification, grading, training, and ultimate assignment of men. e. To assist in discovering men of superior mental ability who should be selected for officers' training camps, for promotion, or for assignment to special tasks. f. To assist in discovering and properly placing men of marked special skill, as for example, observers or scouts for intelligence service. g to assist in discovering men who are mentally inferior and who in accordance with degree of defectiveness should be recommended for discharge, development battalions, labour organisations or regular military training. 2. General plan of examination 1. Segregation of men obviously illiterate 2. Group examination alpha for literates Time 40 to 50 minutes Number 100 to 200 men in a group 3. Group examination beta for illiterates and men failing in examination alpha. Time 50 to 60 minutes. Number up to 60 men in a group. 4. Individual examinations for men failing in beta or referred. Point scale examination. Stanford Bennett examination. Performance scale examination. Time 15 to 60 minutes. Mechanical skill examination. Supplementary. Time 15 to 30 minutes. The order of procedure is as follows. A. A group consisting of 100-200 men will report to the psychological examiner at designated room for examination alpha. B. Men who cannot read and write English at all should first be eliminated from this group by directing those who cannot read or write to stand and by observing the manner in which the remainder fill out the headings of the examination alpha blank. Those who are eliminated should be sent to the special beta examining room. The remainder should be given examination alpha. C. Men found later to have made scores of less than 15 raw score in examination alpha should be given examination beta. D. Individuals rated D- after beta or after alpha and beta will report by appointment for individual examination. It is estimated that not over 5% of the strength of an organization should require individual psychological examination. Summary All enlisted men take either alpha or beta. Those who can read and write English take alpha immediately. Those who cannot take beta immediately. Those who make scores of less than 15 in alpha take beta. All who fail in beta take individual examination. The form of individual examination given varies with the characteristics of the subject. Point scale or Stanford bin examination may be given to subjects who are able to understand English fairly well. To all other subjects, performance scale examination should be given either alone or in addition to one of the other scales. 3. Organization and Routine The value of these examinations will depend upon the perfection of organization and the efficiency of the routine procedure which is developed by the examining staff. The following points are especially important. A. Previous arrangement should ensure the prompt reporting of men, either by groups or individually, at a given time and place for prescribed examination. Company officers or company in groups to be examined should be asked to list men who give trouble or whom they would like to see examined individually. Reasons and company records should be noted in each case. b. 
group and individual examination blanks should be scored and recorded as promptly as possible and ratings prepared for immediate report the chief psychological examiner is responsible for one complete fill of all examinations to be kept in easily accessible form by organizations all available lists of names such as company rosters personal officer lists etc should be used by examiners to simplify and to increase the accuracy of the reports Time will often be saved by typing or writing scores directly on such lists, especially if they can be obtained in duplicate or triplicate. C. The intelligence rating of every man examined should be reported promptly to a personal officer, with comment concerning any special aptitude noted. Company commanders should also have all available information as soon as men are assigned. D. All cases of mental deficiency, as well as all cases for which neuropsychiatric examination is especially indicated should be referred promptly to the psychiatrist through the camp or division surgeon complete report of psychological examination on blank furnished for the purpose must accompany every such case whether referred or for discharge assignment to special organization or neuropsychiatric examination e psychological record card complete with recommendation and disposition of case and report on cases recommended for neuropsychiatric examination should be forwarded to the Surgeon General's Office, Division of Psychology, after the soldier has left camp. F. Weekly statistical sheet should be sent promptly on or before Tuesday of each week to Surgeon General's Office. It should be supplemented by such letter statements and special reports as seem desirable. G. Every effort should be made to cooperate as fully and effectively as possible with all officers of the camp or division for the increased efficiency of the army. February 2nd, 1918. The following instructions were issued by the divisions concerned to promote cooperation and increase the efficiency of the psychological and neuropsychiatric services. Provision for coordination of psychiatric and psychological examinations in division training camps. It is agreed between the Division of Psychology and the Division of Neuropsychiatry. 1. That psychiatric surveys of organizations shall be made in conjunction with psychological survey. 2. That for this purpose psychiatric examiners shall be present at group psychological examinations to observe the behavior and appearance of soldiers. It is further provided that the work of the psychiatrist shall not interfere with the proper conduct of psychological examination. 3. That rooms numbered 5 and 6 in psychology building shall be designated for psychiatric examination. 4. That the name, rank and organisation of individuals receiving grade E in group psychological examination shall be reported promptly to the division psychiatrist through the division surgeon. 5. That report of individual psychological examination shall be accepted by psychiatrist as part of the medical examination and shall be included in the case record if a subject be recommended for discharge or for special assignment. Pierce Bailey, Major, MRC, Chief of Division of Neuropsychiatry. Robert M. Yerkes, Major, SCNA, Chief of Division of Psychology. 4. Utilization of Results Psychological ratings should be valued alike to personal officers, line officers, and medical officers. To the first, as partial basis for placement of soldiers, to the second, as supplementary information for guidance in connection with training, or special treatment of men who give trouble, and to the third, as partial basis for recommendation for discharge, special examination, or medical treatment. The results of examination should be made available to these officers as early as possible. It is therefore the duty of the psychological examiner to see that every drafted man is examined as promptly as possible after arrival in camp, and that report is immediately made to the personal officer to the medical officer if the case requires it, and subsequently to the company commander to whom the man is assigned. The draft contains an adequate number of high-grade men to fill positions of responsibility. The psychological examination helps to reveal non-commissioned officer material and suitable candidates for officers' training camps. It also supplies partial basis for assignment of men to specific trades or occupations in the army. In making selections for training in any specialized branch of military service, it will probably be wise to select individuals whose intelligence scores are well above the lower quartile for the occupation in question. Apart from inequalities in experience or special training, the difference in the scores of two men will, in a general way, indicate their relative value for assignment to a specific trade or occupation. 
Emphasis should be placed upon the desirability of balancing the special trades and occupations in the various companies and regiments. Each unit should have its proper share of high, medium and low grade men for special assignments as well as for the ranks. It is evident that the ultimate value of the psychological service in balancing the units will depend very largely upon the establishment of proper cooperative relations with personal officers. Frequent conferences with the personal officers should be held and ways and means considered for securing effective coordination of effort. To be of the greatest value, the psychological examination should be given at the earliest possible date after the arrival of the men in camp in order that the personal officer may have the results on the qualification cards when making assignments. Unless the scores are available and used properly at this time, companies will be built up that are very uneven in general intelligence. In order to balance companies and regiments satisfactorily, it is necessary to observe not only the special requirements laid down in the tables of organization, but also the requirements that there shall be equivalent grades of intelligence in company organizations and the various trades and occupations demanded in each. Cooperative relations should be established between psychiatrists and psychological examiners in order that company commanders and personal officers may obtain promptly detailed information concerning any individual recruit. The lower grades of mental capacity are clearly indicated by the alpha and beta examinations. The lowest cases should be given individual examination with the least possible delay. Company commanders should be encouraged to refer for examination men whose drill or conduct is unsatisfactory where development battalions have been formed, special study should be made of the results of the development work in the case of men of various grades of intelligence. The psychological service should be able to make an effective contribution in the handling of development units. 5. Conferences with Officers In order that the results of examinations may be used effectively, it is necessary that psychological examiners take pains to acquaint all officers in their stations with the nature and use of intelligence ratings. To this end, conferences with groups of officers by regiments or other convened unit should be arranged by the chief psychological examiner. In these conferences, the methods of examining should be explained clearly and simply, and the possible ways of using psychological information described and illustrated. The examiner should strive especially to take the military point of view. Unwarranted claims concerning the accuracy of the results should be avoided. In general, straightforward common sense statements will be found more convincing than technical descriptions, statistical exhibits, or academic arguments. In order to make such conferences of the greatest value, the views and criticisms of officers should be elicited as fully as possible. In this way, misunderstandings will be cleared up and the way paid for effective cooperation. The criticisms most likely to arise are the following. 1. That the score made is greatly influenced by such accidental factors as fatigue, homesickness, illness, time of day, etc. 2. That the tests do not measure real ability but instead merely reflect the man's educational and social advantages. 3. That the score may be greatly influenced by coaching or by a repetition of the test. While it has been well enough established that such factors as these are not presented in a sufficient degree to invalidate seriously the test results. Their presence cannot be denied. It can hardly be claimed that the mental or physical condition of the subject and the circumstances under which the test is given have no effect upon the score. Similarly, it would be unreasonable to suppose that the result is wholly uninfluenced by educational advantages. While coaching is not likely to invalidate the results to any great extent in army testing, it is nevertheless a factor which should be carefully guarded against by measures designed to prevent the dissemination of blanks. As regards practice effects, it has been found that the average gain in a repeated alpha examination is approximately 8 points raw score. The PE of an alpha raw score is approximately 5 points. While cases will admittedly occur in which men will receive a rating on the psychological examination somewhat higher or lower than they deserve, this would occur on any method of classification that might be used. Mistake. It may well be emphasized that the psychological examination furnishes for immediate use a rating of the men, which, in validity, compares not unfavorably with ratings furnished by officers after months of acquaintance. In using the psychological results, there is a tendency to overlook the fact that they give evidence concerning but one quality important to a good soldier. The company commander should be cautioned not to neglect the importance of other qualities such as personal appearance, energy, military experience, leadership, initiative, tact, etc. As no criticism of the psychological rating 
that it fails to measure these other qualities of the soldier. All it does is to afford a reasonably reliable measure of one central quality, i.e. general intelligence. Although there is a fairly high correlation between general intelligence and other desirable traits like character, leadership, etc., the fact must not be overlooked that there are individuals of high intelligence who are not properly fitted to command. It has been proved quite definitely that the results of the psychological examinations are valuable when properly used. They cannot, however, be made to take the place of all other criteria. Each officer should be encouraged to scrutinize the men of his command carefully in order to discover their individual differences in other traits as well as in intelligence. Individual cases will be found in which the information of the company commander is greatly at variance with the psychological rating. In such cases, one would not be warranted in making sweeping claims for the infallibility of the test results. It should be pointed out that the discrepancy may be due to the presence or absence of important traits not measured by the intelligence examination. Such cases, however, afford opportunity for the psychological examiner to make clear the value of a rating which is absolute rather than relative. The company commander will readily appreciate the fact that his own estimate is relative, that he inevitably judges his men with reference to the average in his company. For this reason, in the company which the general is inferior, a high man will be overestimated. Similarly, in a special high company, a low man will be underestimated. Company commanders will readily appreciate the importance of bringing to light extreme cases of unevenness in different organizations in order that such inequalities may be remedied. 2. Segregation of illiterates. Subjects reporting to group examination belong in one of the following classes. 1. Men totally illiterate or unable to understand English. 2. Men who read or write English only with difficulty. 3. Men who read and write English readily. Examination Alpha will not measure the intelligence of the first group. It may or may not yield a reliable measure for the second group. It will measure the intelligence of the third group. Group 1 should be given beta only. Group 3 should be given alpha, but not beta unless the score earned in alpha was below D. Group 2 should be given both alpha and beta in order that men making below D in alpha because of language difficulty may have opportunity to improve their scores in examination beta. Examiners should eliminate the outset of examination alpha in total literates and men who cannot understand English by ordering these to stand and leave the alpha room. They may then be referred to examination beta. Officers' statements that men cannot read and write may be used to advantage in making this separation. After these men have been segregated and the remaining group satisfactorily placed, each man is supplied with a pencil. Then, E should say, We are going to pass around some papers now. Don't turn any of the pages until I tell you to. Have assistants distributed alpha booklets face up, making sure that only one is handed to each man. As soon as the booklets have been distributed, E should continue slowly and distinctly, pausing after each instruction to give subjects time to respond. Now, at the top of the page before you, print your name after the word name. Print your first name first, then your middle initial, if any, and then your last name. Take time to print very plainly. After name has been written, say, put your rank in the army after the word rank, such as private, corporal, sergeant, sergeant first class, etc. Put your age and years after the word age. In the next line, write your company, regiment, arm, and division. E should mention designation of these. In the next line, write the name of the state or country in which you were born. If you were not born in this country, tell next the number of years you have lived in the United States. After race, write the word white. In examining Negro troops, substitute the word Negro. If there are Indians in the group, ask them to write the word Indian. Similarly for Chinese, Japanese, Filipinos, etc. In the next line after occupation, write your usual work, trade or business, such as carpenter, grocery clerk, labourer, farmer, student. Next, put down how much you earned a week before you entered the army. Not how much a day or a month, but how much a week. After schooling, draw a line under the highest grade for school you attended. For example, if the highest grade you attended was the fifth grade, draw a line under grade five. If you attended the second year in the high school or preparatory school, draw a line under high school, year two, etc. After these directions have been given, the orderlies should systematically examine the paper of each man to discover his ability to carry out the above directions. 
Those subjects who are unable to read and write sufficiently to fill out these headings should be commanded to stand, and on completion of preliminary survey by examiner and his assistants should be ordered to the examining room for examination beta. The above direction is based upon the assumption that a man who cannot understand the directions given by E, read the words occupation, weekly wages, schooling, etc., and write the necessary replies, cannot do justice to himself in examination alpha. 3. Group Examination Alpha 1. Procedure Examination Alpha is to be given to all subjects who remain in the room after the examination of illiterates. In giving the following directions, E should speak rather slowly, distinctly, and with proper emphasis. He should expect and demand perfect order and prompt response to commands. When everything is ready, E proceeds as follows. Attention! The purpose of this examination is to see how well you can remember, think, and carry out what you are told to do. We are not looking for crazy people. The aim is to help find out what you are best fitted to do in the Army. The grade you make in this examination will be put on your qualification card and will also go to your company commander. Some of the things you are told to do will be very easy, some you may find hard. You are not expected to make a perfect grade, but do the very best you can. Now, in the army a man often has to listen to commands and then carry them out exactly. I am going to give you some commands to see how well you can carry them out. Listen closely, ask no questions. Do not watch any other man to see what he does. Look at your papers. Just below where you have been writing, there are several sets of forms, circles, triangles, and so forth. First, you will be told to do something with the circles at 1, afterwards with the circles at 2, and so on. When I call attention, stop instantly whatever you are doing and hold your pencil up so. Don't put your pencil down to the paper until I say go. Examiner lowers his pencil. Listen carefully to what I say. Do just what you are told to do. As soon as you are through, pencils up. Remember, wait for the word go. NB, examiner. Give the following instructions very distinctly and at a moderate speed. After giving the command attention, always notice carefully and have orderlies notice whether all pencils are up. Never proceed until they are. This is especially important at the beginning. Be careful to use the directions that fit the form of alpha booklet distributed. Be careful not to pause or to drop the voice in the course of a compound direction, e.g. in three before the words and also. Raise your pencil whenever you say attention. Lower it promptly whenever you say go. Test 1, Form 5 1. Attention, attention. Always means pencils up. Look at the circles at 1. When I say go, but not before, make a cross in the first circle and also a figure 1 in the third circle. Go. Allow not over 5 seconds. 2. Attention. Look at 2, where the circles have numbers in them. When I say go, draw a line from circle 1 to circle 4 that will pass above circle 2 and below circle 3. Go. Allow not over 5 seconds. 3. Attention. Look at the square and triangle at 3. When I say go, make a cross in the space which is in the triangle, but not in the square. And also make a figure 1 in the space which is in the triangle and in the square. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 4. Attention. Look at 4. When I say go, make a figure 1 in the space which is in the circle, but not in the triangle or square, and also make a figure 2 in the space which is in the triangle and circle, but not in the square. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. NB. Examiner. In reading 5, don't pause the word circle as if ending a sentence. 5. Attention. Look at 5. If a machine gun can shoot more bullets a minute than a rifle, then, when I say go, put a cross in the second circle. If not, draw a line under the word no. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 6. Attention. Look at 6. When I say go, put in the second circle the right answer to the question, how many months has a year? In the third circle, do nothing, but in the fourth circle, put any number that is a wrong answer to the question that you have just answered correctly. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 7. Attention. Look at 7. When I say go, cross out the letter just before C and also draw a line under the second letter before H. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 8. Attention. Look at 8. 
notice the three circles and the three words. When I say go, make in the first circle the first letter of the first word, in the second circle the first letter of the second word, and in the third circle the last letter of the third word. Go. Allow not over ten seconds. 9. Attention. Look at 9. When I say go, cross out each number that is more than 20 but less than 30. Go. Allow not over 15 seconds. 10. Attention. Look at 10. Notice that the drawing is divided into five parts. When I say go, put a 3 or a 2 in each of the two largest parts and any number between 4 and 7 in the part next in size to the smallest part. Go. Allow not over 15 seconds. 11. Attention. Look at 11. When I say go, draw a line through every even number that is not in a square, and also through every odd number that is in a square with a letter. Go. Allow not over 25 seconds. 12. Attention. Look at 12. If 7 is more than 5, then, when I say go, cross out the number 6, unless 6 is more than 8, in which draw a line under the number 7. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. During the rest of the examination, don't turn any page forward or backward unless you are told to. Now turn over the page to test 2. Test 1. Form 6. 1. Attention. Attention always means pencils up. Look at the circles at 1. When I say go, but not before, make a cross in the second circle and also a figure 1 in the third circle. Go. Allow not over 5 seconds. 2. Attention. Look at 2. Where the circles have numbers in them, when I say go, draw a line from circle 2 to circle 5 that will pass above circle 3 and below circle 4. Go. Allow not over 5 seconds. 3. Attention. Look at the square and triangle at 3. When I say go, make a cross in the space which is in the square, but not in the triangle. And also make a figure 1 in the space which is in the triangle and not in the square. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 4. Attention. Look at 4. When I say go, make a figure 1 in the space which is in the triangle, but not in the circle or square. And also make a figure 2 in the space which is in the square and circle, but not in the triangle. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. NB. Examiner. In reading 5, don't pause the word circle as if ending a sentence. 5. Attention. Look at 5. If a regiment is bigger than a company, then, when I say go, put a cross in the first circle. If not, draw a line under the word no. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 6. Attention. Look at 6. When I say go, put in the second circle the right answer to the question, how many months has a year? In the fourth circle, do nothing. But in the fifth circle, put any number that is a wrong answer to the question that you just answered correctly. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 7. Attention. Look at 7. When I say go, Cross out the letter just before D, and also draw a line under the second letter before I. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 8. Attention. Look at 8. Notice the three circles and the three words. When I say go, make in the first circle the last letter of the first word, and in the second circle the last letter of the second word, and in the third circle the third letter of the third word. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 9. Attention. Look at 9. When I say go, cross out each number that is more than 30, but less than 40. Go. Allow not over 15 seconds. 10. Attention. Look at 10. Notice that the drawing is divided into five parts. When I say go, put a 3 or a 2 in each of the two smallest parts and any number between 4 and 7 in the second part in size to the largest part. Go. Allow not over 15 seconds. 11. Attention. Look at 11. When I say go, draw a line through every odd number that is not in a circle, and also through every odd number that is in a circle with a letter. Go. Allow not over 25 seconds. 12. Attention. Look at 12. If 6 is more than 4, then when I say go, cross out the number 5 unless 5 is more than 7. In which case, draw a line under the number 6. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. During the rest of this examination, don't turn any page forward or backward unless you are told to. Now turn over the page to test 2. Test 1, Form 7. 1. Attention. Attention always means pencils up. Look at the circles at 1. 
when I say go, but not before, make a figure 1 in the first circle and also draw a cross in the third circle. Go. Without not over 5 seconds. 2. Attention. Look at 2, where the circles have numbers in them. When I say go, draw a line from circle 3 to circle 6. They will pass above circle 4 and below circle 5. Go. Allow not over 5 seconds. 3. Attention. Look at the square and triangle at 3. When I say go, make a figure 1 in the space which is in the triangle but not in the square. And also make a cross in the space which is in the triangle and in the square. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 4. Attention. Look at 4. When I say go, make a figure 1 in the space which is in the square but not in the circle or triangle. And also make a figure 2 in the space which is in the circle and triangle but not in the square. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. NB Examiner. In reading 5, don't pause at the word circle as if ending a sentence. 5. Attention. Look at 5. If a battleship is larger than a submarine, then, when I say go, put a cross in the third circle. If not, draw a line under the word no. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 6. Attention. Look at 6. When I say go, put in the first circle the right answer to the question. How many months has a year? In the third circle, do nothing, but in the fourth circle, put any number that is a wrong answer to the question that you just answered correctly. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 7. Attention. Look at 7. When I say go, cross out the letter just before E, and also draw a line under the second letter before H. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 8. Attention. Look at 8. Notice the three circles and the three words. When I say go, make in the first circle the first letter of the first word, in the second circle the second letter of the second word, in the third circle the last letter of the last word. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 9. Attention. Look at 9. When I say go, cross out each number that is more than 40 but less than 50. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 10. Attention. Look at 10. Notice that the drawing is divided into 5 parts. When I say go, put a 4 or a 5 in each of the two smallest parts and any number between 6 and 9 in the part next in size to the largest part. Go. Allow not over 15 seconds. 11. Attention. Look at 11. When I say go, draw a line through every even number that is not in a circle and also through every odd number that is in a circle with a letter. Go. Allow not over 25 seconds. 12. Attention. Look at 12. If 5 is more than 3, then when I say go, cross out the number 4 unless 4 is more than 6, in which case draw a line under the number 5. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. During the rest of this examination, don't turn any page backward or forward unless you are told to. Now turn over the page to test 2. Test 1, Form 8. 1. Attention. Attention always means pencils up. Look at the circles at 1. When I say go, but not before, make a figure 2 in the second circle and also cross in the third circle. Go. Allow not over 5 seconds. 2. Attention. Look at 2, where the circles have numbers in them. When I say go, draw a line from circle 1 to circle 4 that will pass below circle 2 and above circle 3. Go. Allow not over 5 seconds. 3. Attention. Look at the square and triangle at 3. When I say go, make a figure 1 in the space which is in the square, but not in the triangle, and also make a cross in the space which is in the triangle and in the square. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 4. Attention. Look at 4. When I say go, make a figure 2 in the space which is in the circle, but not in the triangle or square, and also make a figure 3 in the space which is in the triangle and circle, but not in the square. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. NB Examiner. In reading 5, don't pause the word circle as if ending a sentence. 5. Attention. Look at 5. If taps sound in the evening, then when I say go, put a cross in the first circle. If not, draw a line under the word no. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 6. Attention. Look at 6. When I say go, put in the first circle the right answer to the question. How many months has a year? In the second circle, do nothing. But in the fifth circle, put any number that is a wrong answer to the question you have just answered correctly. Go. 
Allow not over 10 seconds. 7. Attention. Look at 7. When I say go, cross out the letter just after F, and also draw a line under the second letter after I. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 8. Attention. Look at 8. Notice the three circles and the three words. When I say go, make in the first circle the last letter of the first word, in the second circle the middle letter of the second word, and in the third circle the first letter of the third word. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 9. Attention. Look at 9. When I say go, cross out each number that is more than 50 but less than 60. Go. 10. Attention. Look at 10. Notice that the drawing is divided into five parts. When I say go, put a 4 or a 5 in each of the two largest parts, and any number between 6 and 9 in the part next in size to the smallest part. Go. Allow not over 15 seconds. 11. Attention. Look at 11. When I say go, draw a line through every odd number that is not in a square, and also through every odd number that is in a square with a letter. Go. Allow not over 25 seconds. 12. Attention. Look at 12. If 4 is more than 2, then, when I say go, cross out the number 3 unless 3 is more than 5. In which case, draw a line under the number 4. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. During the rest of this examination, don't turn any page forward or backward unless you are told to. Now turn over the page to test 2. Test 1. Form 9. 1. Attention. Attention always means pencils up. Look at the circles at 1. When I say go, but not before, make a cross in the first circle and also a figure 1 in the last circle. Go. Allow not over 5 seconds. 3. Attention. Look at the square and triangle at 3. When I say go, make a figure 2 in the space which is in the triangle but not in the square, and also make a figure 3 in the space which is in the square and in the triangle. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 4. Attention. Look at 4. When I say go, make a figure 2 in the space which is in the triangle but not in the circle or square, and also make a figure 3 in the space which is in the square and circle but not in the triangle. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. NB, examiner. In reading 5, don't pause at the word circle as if ending a sentence. 5. Attention. Look at 5. If a captain is superior to a corporal, then when I say go, put a cross in the second circle. If not, draw a line under the word no. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 6. Attention. Look at 6. When I say go, put in the third circle the right answer to the question, how many months has a year? In the fourth circle, do nothing. But in the fifth circle, put any number that is a wrong answer to the question that you just answered correctly. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 7. Attention. Look at 7. When I say go, cross out the letter just after G and also draw a line under the second letter after H. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 8. Attention. Look at 8. Notice the three circles and the three words. When I say go, make in the first circle the third letter of the first word, in the second circle the first letter of the second word, and in the third circle the first letter of the third word. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. 9. Attention. Look at 9. When I say go, cross out each number that is more than 60 but less than 70. Go. Allow not over 15 seconds. 10. Attention. Look at 10. Notice that the drawing is divided into five parts. When I say go, put a 2 or a 3 in each of the two largest parts and any number between 6 and 9 in the part next in size to the smallest part. Go. Allow not over 15 seconds. 11. Attention. Look at 11. When I say go, draw a line through every even number that is not in a square, and also through every odd number that is in a square with a letter. Go. Allow not over 25 seconds. 12. Attention. Look at 12. If 3 is more than 1, then when I say go, cross out the number 2 unless 2 is more than 4, in which case draw a line under the number 3. Go. Allow not over 10 seconds. During the rest of this examination, don't turn any page forward or backward unless you are told. Now turn over the page to test 2. Test 2. Arithmetical Problems Attention. Look at the directions at the top of the page while I read them. Get the answer to these examples as quickly as you can. Use the side of this page to figure on if you need to. 
I will say stop at the end of five minutes. You may not be able to finish all of them, but do as many as you can in the time allowed. The two samples are already answered correctly. Ready, go. After five minutes, say stop. Turn over the page to test three. Test three, practical judgment. Attention, look at the directions at the top of the page while I read them. This is a test of common sense. Below are 16 questions. Three answers are given to each question. You are to look at the answers carefully, then make a cross in the square before the best answer to each question, as in the sample. Why do we use stoves? Because they look well, they keep us warm, they are black. Here the second answer is the best one and is marked with a cross. Begin with number one and keep on until time is called. Ready, go. After one and a half minutes, say stop. Turn over the page to test four. Test four. Synonym. Antonym. Attention. Look at the directions at the top of the page while I read them. E reads slowly. If the two words of a pair mean the same or nearly the same, draw a line under same. If they mean the opposite or nearly the opposite, draw a line under opposite. If you cannot be sure, guess. The two samples are already marked as they should be. Ready, go. After one and a half minutes, say stop. Turn over the page to test five. Pause. Now you have to turn your books around this way. Examiner illustrates the necessary rotation. Test five. Disarranged sentences. Attention. Look at the directions at the top of the page while I read them. E reads slowly. The words A eats cow grass. In that order are mixed up and don't make a sentence. But they would make a sentence if put in the right order. A cow eats grass. And this statement is true. Again, the words horses, feathers, have all. Would make a sentence if put in the order all horses have feathers. But this statement is false. Below are 24 mixed up sentences. Some of them are true and some are false. When I say go, take these sentences one at a time. Think what each would say if the words were straightened out, but don't write them yourself. Then, if what it would say is true, draw a line under the word true. If what it would say is false, draw a line under the word false. If you cannot be sure, guess. The two samples are already marked, as they should be. Begin with number one and work right down the page until time is called. Ready, go. After two minutes, say stop. Turn over the page to test six. Test six. Number series completion. NB, examiner. Give these instructions very slowly. Attention. Look at the first sample row of figures at the top of the page. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. The two numbers that should come next are, of course, fourteen, sixteen. Look at the second sample. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. The two numbers that should come next are 3, 2. Look at the third sample. 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4. The two numbers that should come next are 5, 5. Now look at the fourth sample. 1, 7, 2, 7, 3, 7. The next two numbers would, of course, be 4, 7. Look at each row of numbers below, and on the two dotted lines, write the two numbers that should come next. Ready? Go. After three minutes, say stop. Turn over the page to test 7. Test 7. Analogies. Attention. Look at the first sample at the top of the page. Sky, blue. Grass, table, green. Warm, big. Notice the four words in heavy type. One of them, green, is underlined. Grass is green, just as the sky is blue. Look at the second sample. Fish, swims. Man, paper, time, walks, girl. Here the word walks is underlined. A man walks and a fish swims. Look at the third sample, day, night. White, red, black, clear, pure. Here the word black is underlined because black is the opposite of white, just as night is the opposite of day. In each of the lines below, the first two words are related to each other in some way. What you are to do in each line is to see what the relation is between the first two words and underline the word in heavy type that is related in the same way to the third word. Begin with number one, and mark as many sets as you can before the time is called. Ready, go. After three minutes, say stop. Turn over the page to test eight. Test eight, information. Attention. Look at the directions at the top of the page while I read them. E, read slowly. Notice the sample sentence. People here with the eyes, 
ears, nose, mouth. The correct word is ears because it makes the truest sentence. In each of the sentences below, you have four choices for the last word. Only one of them is correct. In each sentence, draw a line under the one of these four words which makes the truest sentence. If you cannot be sure, guess. The two samples are already marked as they should be. Ready, go. After four minutes, say stop. Turn over the page to test one again. In the upper right-hand corner, where it says group number, put the number 101, or 102, 103, etc., according to the number of this group in the examiner's series of groups. Have all examination booklets and pencils collected immediately and before the men are allowed to leave their seats. Before dismissing the group, the number of booklets collected should be carefully checked with the number of men present and the number of booklets issued. 2. Directions for scoring. General rules. 1. Each item is scored either right or wrong. No part credits are given. 2. In general, items evidently corrected stand as corrected. 3. In tests where the score is number right, only wrong items need to be checked in scoring. In tests 4 and 5, where the score is right minus wrong, wrong and omitted items must be separately checked. 4. Indicate the last item attempted by drawing a long line under that item and out into the margin. 5. Enter the score for each test in lower right-hand corner of the test page and encircle it. When the test has been rescored, a check mark may be made beside the circle. 6. Red or blue pencil increases accuracy of scoring. Test 1. Score is number right. 1. No credit is given for any item in which more is done than the instructions require. 2. In an item where something is to be written in a given space, give credit for if a mark crosses a line from haste or awkwardness. Give no credit to the position is really ambiguous. 3. Where something is to be underlined or crossed out, give credit if two or three underlinings are made in the required place and give credit for any method of crossing out. 4. Item 2. The pencil line must begin and end either on the circumference or within the circles indicated. It may touch the intermediate circles, but must not cut through them. 5. Item 6. In the circle marked not 12, there must be some number which is not 12, such as 5, 0, 27. 6. Item 9. The proper numbers must be crossed out to receive credit. 7. Item 10. In form 5, 2 alone and 3 alone, but not 2 or 3, in each of the two largest parts. 5 alone and 6 alone, but not 5 or 6 in the next to the smallest part, are correct. Similarly for other forms. 8. Item 11. The lines must cross or at least touch the proper numbers. They may or may not cut the accompanying letters. Mere indication of the square, triangle, etc. is not sufficient. 9. Item 12. Underlining in place of crossing out is wrong. Test 2. Score is number right. 1. Answer may be written on dotted line or elsewhere near its problem. 2. If two answers are given to any problem, count as wrong. 3. If it seems clear that, by a slip, one answer has been put in the wrong brackets and the next answers are all thus misplaced, give credit for the answers that are right, even if misplaced. 4. Omission of dollar sign is permissible. 5. Omission of decimal point is permissible on items 2, 9, 13 and 14. Fraction may be expressed as decimal in item 15. Test 3. Score is number right. 1. Any clear method of indicating answer is given full credit, underlining, checking, etc. 2. If two answers are marked, count as wrong unless one is clearly indicated as final. Test 4. Score is number right minus number wrong. 1. Any clear method of indicating answer is given credit. 2. When both same and opposite underline counts as omitted, not as wrong. 3. If only same is underlined, write down the column. Score for the test is 0. Similarly, if opposite is underlined, write down the column. Test 5. Score is number right minus number wrong. Same rules as for test 4. Test 6. Score is number right. 1. If only one number is written, give no credit. 2. If only one of the numbers is right, give no credit. 3. If four numbers are written, as frequently happens with certain items, i.e. 33, 11 instead of 3, 3, give full credit. Test 7. Score is number right. 
1. Any clear indication other than underlining receives full credit. 2. Underlining of any of the first three words of an item does not remove credit. 3. If two or more of the last words are marked, give no credit. Test 8. Score is number right. Same rules as for test 7. Keys to tests. The following keys for the several tests of the alpha examination which demand them are additions to the examiner's guide. Keys not printed during the war, either in the guide or elsewhere. Pages 70 to 78 contain the keys for the alpha tests. 3. Total score and rating. The result of examination alpha is expressed in a total score, which is the sum of the raw scores of the several tests. The raw scores are obtained as follows. A graph is displayed on the page with three columns of test, method of scoring, and maximum raw score. Letter ratings are assigned on examination alpha as follows. A graph is displayed with two columns with ratings and score. All ratings above D- are entered and are reported at once. Men whose scores are below D are recalled for examination. Chalk, eraser, pointer, and a curtain for covering beta apparatus are also necessary. 2. Procedure It is most important that examination beta be given in a genial manner. The subjects who take this examination sometimes sulk and refuse to work. E and his assistants will find it necessary to fill out most of the headings for the men before the examination begins. The time required for this preparatory work may be used to advantage in making the men feel at ease. As a demonstration preparatory to each test requires some time, the pencils up command is omitted in examination beta. The examiner's platform should be so high that he can readily see whether or not the subjects are working. Great care should be taken to prevent the over-anxious from beginning work before the command go. Seating conditions should be such that subjects cannot copy from one another, and the rule that copying shall not be allowed should be enforced strictly. The blackboard should at all times be kept clean, so that the visual conditions may be excellent and constant. The blackboard figures for test 1 should be exposed when the subjects enter the examining room. As soon as the test has been demonstrated and the men have been told to go ahead, the blackboard should be covered and kept covered until time is called. It should not be turned to the next test until the men have been ordered to stop work on a given test. Care should be taken to have the physical conditions of examination reasonably uniform. With the exemption of the brief introductory statements and a few orders, instructions are to be given throughout by means of gestures instead of words. These gestures accompany the samples and demonstrations and should be animated and emphatic. It is absolutely necessary that directions be followed closely and procedure kept uniform and definite. Variations of procedure are more likely to occur in beta than in alpha, and there is serious risk that if allowed they will lessen the value of results. E should especially guard against using more or fewer gestures or words for one group than for another. Oral language should be rigidly limited to the words and phrases given in the procedure for the different tests. Whether the men get the idea of the test and enter into it with the proper spirit will depend chiefly on the skill with which the examiner, the demonstrator and the orderlies carry out their respective parts. Examiner and demonstrator especially should be selected with the greatest care. An examiner who succeeds admirably in giving alpha may prove to be entirely unadapted for beta. Both examiner and demonstrator must be adept in the use of gesture language. In the selection of a demonstrator, the personal office should be consulted. One camp has had great success with a window seller as demonstrator. Actors should also be considered for the work. The orderlies should be able to keep the subjects at work without antagonizing them and to keep them encouraged without actually helping them. The demonstrator should have the single task of doing before the group just what the group is later to do with the examination blanks. The blackboard is his beta blank. Before examination beta can be given satisfactorily, the demonstrator must be letter perfect in his part. Both E and demonstrator must be very careful to stand at the side of the blackboard in order not to hide the drawings. As soon as the men of a group have been properly seated, pencils should be distributed, and also examination blanks with test 8 up. While this has been done, E should say, Here are some papers. You must not open them or turn them over until you are told to. Holding up beta blank, 
E continues. In the place where it says name, write your name. Print it if you can. Pause. Fill out the rest of the blank about your age, schooling, etc., as well as you can. If you have any trouble, we will help you. The instructions given under segregation may be used for filling out the beta blank. E should announce the group number and say that it as well as other necessary information is supplied. Before the examination proceeds, each paper should be inspected in order to make sure that it is satisfactorily completed. After the initial information has been obtained, E makes the following introductory remarks. Attention! Watch this man, pointing to demonstrator. He, pointing to demonstrator again, is going to do here, tapping blackboard with pointer, what you, pointing to different members of group, are to do on your papers. Here E points to several papers that lie before men in the group, picks up one, holds it next to the blackboard, returns the paper, points to demonstrator and the blackboard in succession then to the men and their papers. Ask no questions. Wait till I say go ahead. In general, when instructing the group to turn from test to test, E holds up a beta blank before group and follows his own instructions as he gives them. As soon as he has turned to desired test or page, he says, this is test X here, look, pointing to the page. To suggest to the group the necessity of working rapidly, the demonstrator, Artipris, proceeding, very deliberately, with the early samples of each test, hurries as soon as he has worked out the last sample problem. 1. To record his response as fast as he can. 2. Then to catch E's eyes for approval. And 3. Finally to slip away from blackboard, drawing curtain as he does so. After the personal data called for on page 1 of blank have been gathered and recorded, the orderly's vocabulary in beta is richly restricted to the following words or their literal equivalents in Italian, Russian, etc. Yes, no, sure, good, quick, how many, same, fix it. Under no circumstances may substitutional explanations or directions be given. End of chapter 3, section 1. Chapter 3, Section 2 of Army Mental Tests by Clarence Yoakum and Robert Yerkes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Test 1. Maze. Now turn your papers over. This is Test 1 here, pointing to page of record blank. Look. After all have found the page, E continues. Don't make any marks till I say go ahead. Now watch. After touching both arrows, E traces through first maze with pointer and then motions the demonstrator to go ahead. Demonstrator traces path through first maze with crayon, slowly and hesitatingly. E then traces second maze and motions to demonstrate to go ahead. Demonstrator makes one mistake by going into the blind alley at upper left hand corner of maze. E apparently does not notice what demonstrator is doing until he crosses line at end of alley. Then E shakes his head vigorously, says, no, no, takes demonstrator's hand and traces back to the place where he may start right again. Demonstrator traces rest of maze so as to indicate an attempt at haste, hesitating only at ambiguous points. E says good, then holding up blank, Look here, and draws an imaginary line across the page from left to right for every maze on the page. Then, all right, go ahead. Do it, pointing to men and then to books. Hurry up. The idea of working fast must be impressed on the men during the maze test. E and orderlies walk around the room, motioning to men who are not working and saying, Do it, do it, hurry up, quick. At the end of two minutes, E says, Stop. Turn over the page to test two. Test 2. Cube Analysis This is Test 2 here. Look. After everyone has found the page, now watch. The order of procedure is as follows. 1. E points to the three cube model on the blackboard, making a rotary movement of the pointer to embrace the entire picture. 2. With similar motion, he points to the three cube model on the shelf. 3. E points next to picture on blackboard and asks, how much? 4. E turns to cube model and counts aloud, 
putting up his fingers while so doing, and encouraging the men to count with him. 5. E taps each cube on the blackboard and motions to demonstrator asking him how much. 6. Demonstrator, pointing, counts cubes on blackboard silently and writes the figure 3 in proper place. In the second sample of this test, when E counts cubes of model, he 1. Counts the three exposed cubes, 2. Touches the unexposed cube with pointer and 3. Without removing pointer, turns model so that a hidden cube comes into view of group. In other respects, procedure with second and third samples is the same as with first. In counting the 12 cube model E, 1. Counts the top row of cubes in the model, left to right. 2. Counts the exposed bottom row, right to left. 3. Taps with pointer, the end cube of hidden row. 4. Turns the entire model around and completes his counting. E then holds model in the same place as drawing and counts in the same order as above. The cubes on blackboard, counting lines between front and top row as representing the hidden row. He then asks demonstrator how much. Demonstrator counts the cubes on blackboard, pointing but not speaking, and writes the response. Throughout the demonstration, the counting is done deliberately, not more rapidly than one cube per second. At end of demonstration, E points to page and says, All right, go ahead. At the end of two and a half minutes, he says, Stop. Look at me and don't turn the page. Test 3. XO Series This is Test 3 here. Look. After everyone has found the page, now watch. E first points to the blank rectangles at the end, then traces each O in chart, then traces outline of O's in remaining spaces. Demonstrator at a gesture draws them in. E then traces first X in next sample, moves next X by tracing the area of an imaginary semicircle, joining the two, and in the same manner traces each X, moving over an arc to the next. He then traces outlines of X's in the proper blank spaces, moving over the imaginary area in each case, and motions to demonstrator to draw them in. Demonstrator, at a gesture, fills in remaining problems very slowly, standing well to the right of the blackboard and writing with his left hand. E points to page and says, All right, go ahead, hurry up. At the end of one and three quarter minutes, he says, Stop. Turn over the page to test four. Test four. Digit symbol. This is test four here. Look. After everyone has found the page, now watch. E points to first digit of key on blackboard and then points to the symbol under it. Same four nine digits in key. E then one points to first digit of sample. Two to the empty space below digit. Three points to corresponding digit of key. Four points to proper symbol under digit in key. And five traces the outline of the proper symbol in the blank space under the digit in the sample. Same for first five samples. Demonstrator, at a gesture, fills in all the samples working as follows. 1. Touches a number in first sample with index finger of right hand. 2. Holding finger there. Finds of index finger of left hand the corresponding number in key. 3. Drops index finger of left hand to simple for number found. 4. Holding left hand in this position, writes appropriate symbol in the lower half of sample. Similarly, with the other samples while working, demonstrator should stand as far as possible to the left, doing all the samples from the side. At the end of demonstration, E says, look here, and points to key on page, repeating the gestures used in pointing on the blackboard at the beginning of the demonstration. Then all right, go ahead, hurry up. Orderlies point out key to men who are at a loss to find it. At the end of two minutes, E says stop, but don't turn the page. Test 5. Number checking. This is test 5 here. Look. After everyone has found the page, now watch. In this demonstration, E must try to get yes or no responses from the group. If the wrong response is volunteered by group, E points to digit again and gives right response. Yes or no, as the case may be. E points to first digit of first number in left column, then to first digit, first number in right column, and to second digit, first number in left column, and second digit, first number in right column. Nod's head says yes and makes an imaginary cross at end of number in right column. Motions to demonstrator who makes an X there. 
E does the same for second line of figures, but here he indicates clearly by shaking head and saying no that certain digits are not identical. E repeats for three more sets, and after each, looks at group, says yes in questioning tone, and waits for them to say yes or no. E repeats correct reply with satisfaction. Demonstrated checks each after group has responded, or at single from E, if group does not respond. Demonstrator then works out remaining items, pointing from column to column, and working deliberately. E summarizes demonstrator's work by pointing to the whole number in each set and saying yes, indicating X or no if no. He shows again where the numbers are unlike. E then points to page and says, all right, go ahead. Hurry up. At the end of three minutes, E says, stop. Turn over the page to test six. Test six, pictorial completion. This is test six here. Look, a lot of pictures. After everyone has found the page, now watch. E points to hand and says to demonstrator, fix it. Demonstrator does nothing but looks puzzled. E points to the picture of the hand, then to the place where finger is missing and says to demonstrator, fix it, fix it. Demonstrator then draws in finger. E says, that's right. E then points to fish and plays for eye and says, fix it. After demonstrator has drawn missing eye, E points to each of the four remaining drawings and says, fix them all. Demonstrator works samples as slowly and with apparent effort. When the samples are finished, E says, all right, go ahead. Hurry up. During the course of this test, the orderlies walk around the room and locate individuals who are doing nothing, point to their pages and say, fix it, fix them, trying to set everyone working. At end of three minutes, E says, stop, but don't turn over the page. Test 7. Geometrical Construction This is test 7 here. Look. After everyone has found the page, now watch. Examiner points to the first figure on blackboard. He then takes the two pieces of cardboard and fits them onto the similar drawings on blackboard to show that they correspond and puts them together in the square on blackboard to show that they fill it. Then after running his finger over the line of intersection of the parts, E removes the pieces and signals demonstrator who draws solution in the square on blackboard. The same procedure is repeated for the second and third sample. Demonstrator works out fourth sample, after much study, pointed from the square to the forms. Demonstrator first draws the two small squares in the upper half of the large square, then the two triangles in the remaining rectangle. Each small figure is drawn in by tracing its entire circumference, not merely the necessary dividing lines. While drawing each small figure in the large square, demonstrator points with index finger of left hand to the corresponding small figure at left of square, taking care not to obstruct the view. At the end of demonstration, E holds up blank, points to each square on the page and says, All right, go ahead. Hurry up. At end of two and a half minutes, stop. Turn over the page. Papers then collected immediately. 3. Directions for scoring. General rules. 1. In general, items evidently corrected stand as corrected. The only exception to this rule is in the maze test. 2. In tests where the score is number right, only wrong items need to be checked in scoring. In test 5 where the score is right minus wrong, wrong and omitted items must be separately checked. 3. Enter the score for each test in lower right hand corner of the test page and encircle it. When the test has been rescored, a check may be made beside the circle. 4. Red or blue pencil increases accuracy of scoring. Test 1. 1. One half point for each correctly completed half of maze. A half maze is correct if drawn line does not cross any line of maze, except through awkwardness, nor an imaginary straight line across the opening of a wrong passage. 2. Allow much leeway in the cutting of corners. 3. Spur running into any blind passage counts wrong for that half item, even though erased. 4. When two lines are drawn, one straight across the page, the other correct, Full credit is given. Test 2. Score is number right. Test 3. 1. Score is number right. 2. Any incomplete item receives no credit. 3. Count any item correct if intended plan is carried out. Disregard additional unnecessary marks, such as circles between the crosses of items 2 and 4 in first part of line, etc. Test 4. 1. Score is one-third of number of correct symbols. 2. 
Use leniency in judging form of symbol. 3. Credit symbol for 2, even though reversed. Test 5. 1. Score is right minus wrong. Number of items checked that should be checked minus number of items checked that should not be checked. 2. If other clear indication is used instead of crosses, give credit. 3. If numbers which should not be checked are marked by some other sign than is used to check similar pairs, count as though not marked. 4. If all items are checked, the score for that test is 0. Test 6. 1. Score is number right. 2. Allow much awkwardness in drawing. Writing in name of missing part or any way of indicating it receives credit if idea is clear. 3. Additional parts do not make item wrong if proper missing part is also inserted. 4. Rules for individual items. Item 4. Any spoon at an angle in right hand receives credit. Left hand or unattached spoon, no credit. Item 5. Chimney must be in right place. No credit for smoke. Item 6. Another car on the same side as first receives no credit. Item 8. Plain square cross, etc. In proper location for stamp receives credit. Item 10. Missing part is the rivet. Line of ear may be omitted. Item 13. Missing part is leg. Item 15. Ball should be drawn in hand of man. If represented in hand of woman or in motion, no credit. Item 16. Single line indicating net receives credit. Item 18. Any representation intended for horn pointing in any direction receives credit. Item 19. Hand and powder puff must be put on proper side. Item 20. Diamond is a missing part. Failure to complete hilt on sword is not an error. Test 7. 1. Score is number right. 2. Allow considerable awkwardness in drawing. 3. Extra subdivisions, if not erased, make item wrong. 4. Rules for individual items. Item 1. Line of division may be slightly distant from true center and need not be straight. Item 3. Lines of semi-circumference must start from or near corners of square. Item 4. Line must not start from corner. Ratings of D- minus may not be given in examination beta unless recall of the men for individual examination is impossible. 5. Individual examinations. 1. General directions. Purpose. The main purpose of the individual examination is to secure a more accurate measurement of the mental ability of those who have made D- in alpha or beta or in both. By the personal contact it allows it should also yield valuable supplementary information of a kind which cannot be brought out by a group examination. All the kinds of information secured should be considered in connection with recommendation concerning a man. The subjects. Men who are likely to be summoned for individual examination fall into three classes, literates, illiterates, and non-English speaking. Since the procedure of examination varies importantly with the class, the first task of the examiner is to assign the man who has reported for individual examination to his proper category. The following definitions will assist in the process of classifying. Literates. Those who have been allowed to take alpha may ordinarily be considered literate for purpose of individual examination. Subjects who have not taken alpha may be considered literate if they have completed the third grade, or its equivalent, in an American school. He should question S regarding his opportunities for schooling, and if necessary, may test his ability to read and write English. Illiterates are those who do not meet the above requirements, but who understand and speak English fairly well. The subject may be highly illiterate in some language, but illiterate in English. Such are to be classed as illiterate for the present purpose. Non-English speaking subjects are those who, whether foreign born or American born, are unable to understand or speak English sufficiently well to take an oral examination given in English. The majority of such subjects are foreigners, but many foreigners belong in either the literate or the illiterate class instead of the non-English speaking. Choice of examination. Literates should be examined by means of the point scale or the Stanford Binet scale according to availability of materials and preference of the examiner. Usually it will not be necessary to give a literate subject further examination, but if the examiner is in doubt as to proper rating and recommendation concerning subject, he should, after completing examination by the one or the other of these scales, 
supplement his observations by giving such performance tests as seem desirable. Illiterates should be examined by means of one or more of the following systematic procedures. A. The point scale as adapted for illiterates. B. The Stanford Binet scale as adapted for illiterates. C. The performance scale with oral instructions. In certain instances, it may be obviously desirable or necessary to use the performance scale in addition to the one or the other adaptable scale. As a rule, it should be unnecessary to use other than either the point scale or Stanford Binet, complete or adapted, in the case of a subject who has attended an American school as much as four or five years. Inability to read and write after that amount of schooling nearly always indicates grave mental inferiority and should not be considered an excuse for failure on such tests as writing from dictation, counting backward, making change, etc. Those who are illiterate from complete lack of educational opportunity should be given the performance scale. Non-English speaking subjects can be examined safely only by means of the performance scale with non-verbal instructions. Those subjects who understand English slightly may profit from the use of such words as no, yes, etc. For this reason, words may be used by the examiner to supplement his gestures, but they must not be depended upon as a means of conveying the idea of what is to be done at a given test. The duration and extent of an individual examination should depend upon the nature of the case and should vary with information necessary for safe report and recommendation. In some instances, only a few tests need to be given. In others, even a prolonged examination may leave the examiner in doubt concerning suitable recommendation and may force him to appeal to company commander or others for supplementary information unless conditions render haste imperative the examiner should obtain a definite intelligence rating for each subject in terms of mental age condensed instructions for administering the point scale and the stanford binet scale are printed in this guide for the convenience of examiners but these instructions can be used safely only on the basis of thorough knowledge of the detailed descriptions of these two scales which are available in book form the performance scale is fully described in this guide since its constituent parts and their standardization are newly chosen and specially adapted for army use it is the task of the psychological examiner to obtain reliable intelligence ratings and to make recommendations based thereupon where serious mental peculiarities or psychopathic conditions are discovered full report should be made and the subject promptly referred to the psychiatrist with such information as the psychological examination has supplied the examiner's recommendations as a result of careful psychological examination the examiner may conclude one the subject should be assigned a return to appropriate military organization for regular training two that he should be assigned or transferred to the developmental battalion or to service organization in which simple forms of annual labor and the chief requirement three that he should be recommended to the psychiatrist for discharge by reason of intellectual deficiency four that he should be referred to the psychiatrist for further examination because of peculiarities of behaviour or definite psychopathic tendencies. It is impossible to state with safety the particular degree of intellectual deficiency which justifies recommendation for discharge. Other factors than intelligence contribute to a man's serviceableness in the army. This must be taken into account. If the officers who are attempting to train a man are satisfied with his responses, the indications are that he should not be discharged, even if very inferior in intelligence. In general, subjects whose mental age is below eight should be seriously considered for discharge or development battalion. Those whose mental ages range from eight to ten should be considered for use in special service organizations or for assignment to development battalion. All others except those whose psychotic symptoms would cause their immediate reference to the neuropsychiatric examiner should be assigned to regular training organizations. Grade E shall be given to all men who are recommended by the examiner for discharge, development battalion, or service organizations, and to such men only. All men whose intelligence is deemed satisfactory for regular military duty shall be given ratings of D- minus or higher. In this connection, too great emphasis cannot be laid upon the use of common sense as well as technical skill and information by the psychological examiner. While doing his utmost to obtain reliable measurement of mental traits, he should be quick to observe indications of qualities of physique, temperament, and character which are important in the soldier. 2. Point Scale Examination A. Procedure 
The directions for the point scale examination given on page 39 to 44 of the examiner's guide are omitted here because of copyright restrictions. B. Adaptation for use with illiterates. In the examination of an illiterate subject, tests 14 and 18 should be omitted and the following additions made to the total score. A small graph is displayed on the page with total score and points added. C. Expressing and interpreting results. The results of the point scale examination should be expressed in the following ways. 1. Total score. 2. Mental age. 3. Letter rating. The accompanying tables will enable the examiner readily to transmute any point scale score into mental age and letter rating. A table is displayed on the following page. Table of equivalent point scale values. It displays two columns with score and mental age. Subjects obtaining a score of 60 points or more may ordinarily be recommended for regular military training. Subjects obtaining scores from 40 to 59 points should be considered for assignment to service organizations or to a development battalion. Subjects with scores below 40 points should be considered for discharge. Letter ratings should be assigned as follows. A. Not given. B. 95 to 100. C. Plus 90 to 94. C. 80 to 89. C minus 70 to 79, D, 60 to 69, D minus 0 to 59. Grade E shall be given to all men who are recommended by the examiner for rejection, discharge, development, battalion, or service organizations, and to such men only. All men whose intelligence is deemed satisfactory for regular military duty shall be given rating of D minus or higher. 3. Stanford Binet Examination A. Procedure the directions for the Stanford Binet examination on page 47 to 66 of the examiner's guide are omitted here because of copyright restrictions. B. Adaptation for use with literates. In the examination of an illiterate subject, only those tests in each year group which are starred in the record blank should be given. When only the star tests are given, credit should be assigned in accordance with the following table. Years 3 to 10, 3 points or months per test. Year 12, 5 points or months per test. Year 14, 6 points or months per test. Year 16, 7.5 points or months per test. Year 18, 9 points or months per test. The probable error of mental age score derived by the scale is thus abbreviated is approximately 7.5 months as contrasted with a probable error of less than 6 months for the unabbreviated scales applied to unselected adults. C. Expressing and interpreting results. As this is an age scale, the responses are ordinarily scored in terms of months. They may also be scored in terms of points by those who prefer this method. When this is done, each test is given a point value corresponding to its value in months. A subject is credited with a full number of points for each test below the year group actually given, and in addition, with 24 points for years 1 and 2. He is also credited with the actual number of points scored in the year groups given. It is thus possible to score as high as 30 points months in year 16 and 36 in year 18, making a total possible score of 234 points, or a mental age of 19 years 6 months. If fewer than the regular number of tests are used for a given year group, each test should be assigned a proportionally higher point value. If more than the regular number are used, each test should be assigned a proportionally lower value. When half credit is allowed for a response, half the number of points is given. The results of Stanford Burnett examination are to be expressed in the following ways. 1. Mental age in years, decimal of a year. 2. Letter rating. Mental ages correspond to the letter ratings as follows. A. 18 to 19.5. B. 16.5 to 17.9. C plus 15 to 16.4. C. 13 14.9. C minus 11 12.9 D 9.5 to 10.9 D minus below 9.5 Subjects obtaining a score of 10 years 120 points or more may ordinarily be recommended for regular military training. Subjects between 8 and 10 years 96 to 119 points should be considered for assignment to service organization or development battalion. Subjects below 8 years 96 points should be considered for discharge. Grade E should be given to all men who are recommended by the examiner for discharge. 
to fill a battalion or service organization and to such men only all men whose intelligence is deemed satisfactory for regular military duty shall be given rating of d minus or higher end of chapter three section two Chapter 3, Section 3 of Army Mental Tests by Robert Yerkes and Clarence Yoakum. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Leon Harvey. 4. Performance Scale Examination A. Procedure Test 1. The Ship Test Materials a frame and ten paces which, when properly fitted together, form a ship. Directions. E. Shows S. The frame with the pieces properly fitted therein and says, This is a picture of a ship. Look at it carefully. S. Is allowed to look at the pictures for ten seconds. Then E. Withdraws the pictures from view, removes the pieces, and presents the empty frame and the pieces arranged as in figure 13. 1. The pieces may be numbered on the edge towards E from left to right to indicate their positions. The frame is next to the subject. E says, put these pieces in the frame as quickly as you can, so as to make the ship you just saw. Figure 13 is also displayed on the page, with the pieces of the ship relevant to this test. S is given five minutes and is allowed to make any changes he wishes within the time limit, but E must not suggest the changes. Scoring. A score of one is allowed for each of the lower or upper pieces, if placed in the lower or upper portion of the frame, i.e., the water pieces at the bottom and the sky pieces at the top, except that no credit is given for an inverted piece. In addition to this, a score of one is given to each piece that is in its correct relative position in the upper or lower row. The maximum score for accuracy is thus 20 points. If the score for accuracy is 18 or more, an additional credit is given for time as follows. Time, 0 to 20, credit 5. 21 to 30, 4. 31 to 50, 3. 51 to 80, 2, 81 to 120, 1, 121 to 300, 0. The maximum raw score, therefore, is 25 points. Test 2. Mannequin and Feature Profile Materials A. Six pieces, which, when put together, represent the conventional figure of a man. B. Eight pieces, which, when put together, form the figure of a human head. Directions A. The pieces are placed before S, as in figure 14. Each arm and each leg is placed at the opposite side of the body from the place where it fits. E says, put this together as quickly as you can. B. The pieces are placed before S, as in figure 14. The three pieces forming the face are separated from each other by the four pieces forming the ear. E says, put this together as quickly as you can. The time limit for A is 2 minutes, or B, 5 minutes. Figure 14 is displayed on the following page. Spontaneous changes are allowed within the time limit. S is not told what the pieces make. If S scores 3 or less on A, E fits it together correctly, then goes on to B. If the score on A is 0, B need not be given. Scoring. The end products are scored as follows. A. One point for each piece in correct position, i.e. for a perfect performance, 5 points. One or both arms not exactly fitting joints. 4 points. One reversal of arms or legs. 3 points. Two reversals, arms and legs. 2 points. Legs and arms interchanged, or any other result that looks like a man. 1 point. Poorer than this, not resembling a man. 0 points. B. One point for each face piece in correct position. One point for partially correct ear, i.e. one, two or three pieces in the correct place and two points for a completely correct ear, making a total for accuracy of five points. Credit is given for time only if the score for accuracy is on A, four or five points, on B, five points. The credit as follows. A small table is displayed on the page, with three columns of time in A and B, and credits assigned. The maximum raw score is, therefore, 20 points on A and B together. Test 3. Cube Imitation Materials 1. Four one-inch cubes fastened two inches apart to a wooden base. Both cubes and base are painted a dark red. The cubes are numbered one to four from right to left. 2. 
a fifth cube of the same size, unattached and similarly painted. 3. Ten imitation problems, A to J, as printed on the record sheet. Directions. E places the cube board before S, with the numbered sides of the cubes directed away from him, and says, watch carefully, and then do just what I do. E next, with the fifth cube, taps the attached blocks in a predetermined order, as for example in A, 1, 2, 3, 4, at the rate of 1 per second. He now lays the tapping cube down before S, midway between the second and third cubes, but nearer to S than the cube board, and says, do that. If in the first problem S taps 4, 3, 2, 1 instead of the reverse, E credits response and says, no, begin here, pointing to 1. Parts B to J are given in order unless S fails in five successive parts. In this event, the test is discontinued. It is important that the rate of tapping should not be faster than one per second. Scoring. The responses are recorded as right, plus, or wrong, minus, and one point is given for each success. The maximum raw score is 10 points. Test 4. Cube construction. Materials. 1. A block of wood, model 1. 1 by 3 by 3 inches. Painted a dark red on the four sides not on the upper or lower surfaces, and cut to a depth of 2 mm, so that it closely resembles a composite of 9 small cubes. 2. 9 1 inch cubes necessary for the construction of model 1, 4 painted on 2 sides, 4 painted on 1 side, and 1 not painted. 3. A block of wood, model 2, same size as model 1, but painted on the top as well as the 4 sides. 4. 9 1 inch cubes necessary for construction of model 2. 5. A 2 inch cube model 3 unpainted and cut on the 6 surfaces so that it looks like a composite of 8 small cubes. 6. 8 to 1 inch cubes painted on 3 sides for the construction of model 3. Directions E presents model 1 and says, You see this block? Notice that it is painted on the sides but not on the top or the bottom, and you see the smaller blocks. E presents blocks described under 2 above, partially painted and partially unpainted. These nine blocks can be put together so as to make one just like this. E puts the blocks together, pointing to the painted surface or surfaces of each cube as he fits it in position. A. E then presents the same model and blocks in a regular order and says, Now, you fit the blocks together so as to make one like this. B. E now presents model 2 and the blocks for its construction and says, Now put these blocks together so as to make one just like this. Notice that it's painted on the edges and on the top, but not on the bottom. C. E presents model 3 and says, You see this block? Notice that it is not painted anywhere. And you see these smaller blocks, present blocks described by the 6 above, that have 3 sides painted and 3 not painted. Now I want you to fit these 8 blocks together so as to make one just like this. Remember, it is not painted on the bottom, top or sides. With a stopwatch, E takes time in seconds for assembling the cubes. He also counts the number of moves. A move is to be understood as a placement in some position designed to complete the structure. If parts of a structure are assembled separately, putting such parts together does not count an additional move. If the blocks are fitted together in the hand, the moves are counted just as they are assembled on the table. Turning a block over or otherwise shifting its position in the structure is counted a move. But turning it over in the fingers, picking it up and placing it upon the table are not to be counted moves. S is penalised sufficiently for such behaviour by the longer time. Time for work on each part, 2 minutes. If S assembles blocks before time is up, allow spontaneous corrections, counting extra time and additional moves. Each block changed counts one move as before. The time should be taken when S indicates verbally or otherwise that he has finished. Scoring. No credit is to be given for time if the blocks are not all assembled, but if they are, credit as follows. A small table is displayed on the page of three columns with A seconds, B and C seconds and credit. No matter whether S has finished or not, count each misplaced block as three additional moves and each unassembled block as six additional moves, and credit total moves as follows. A small table is displayed with three columns, A and B moves, C moves, and credit. Note that the minimum number of moves is nine for A and B and eight for C. That no credit is given for over 50 moves, and the maximum raw score is 10 points for each part, or a total of 30. Test 5. Form Board Materials See illustration of problems, figure 15, 3, for identification of the materials. Directions E places a board before S, 
arranged as shown in demonstration. E and S in this figure indicate the relative positions of examiner and subject. E says, these blocks can be changed around so as to make room for this extra square like this. E proceeds to solve the problem in the minimum number of moves, making sure that S is attending. A. E now presents the board arranged for problem A, saying, without making any more moves than you have to, change these blocks around so you can find a place for the extra square pointing to square. Don't have any blocks left over. Ready? Go ahead. Figure 15 is displayed on the page. B. E now presents the board arranged for problem B, saying, I want you to change these blocks around so you can find places for these two extra squares pointing to them. Ready? Go ahead. C. E presents the board arranged for problem C, saying, I want you to change the blocks around so you can find places for these four extra blocks. Ready? Go ahead. E records the time in seconds from start to finish and counts the number of moves. A move is to be understood as placing or trying to place a block in some position on the board. Taking a block out of position and placing a block upon the table are not counted as moves. Time for work on A and B, 2 minutes each. On C, 3 minutes. If A is not solved in the time allowed, A demonstrates that correct solution before going on to B. Scoring. If a problem is not solved within the time limit, score that part 0. But if a correct solution has been accomplished, give credit for time and for moves as follows. A table is displayed on the page of two sections with moves and time. In the moves section, there are four columns, A, B, C, and credit. And then time section, there are three columns with A and B, C, and credit. Note that the minimum number of moves for problems A, B, and C is 3, 5, and 8, respectively, and that the maximum raw score are 8, 8, and 10, or a total of 26 points. The examiner will find it advantageous to make a diagram of the arrangement of the blocks for each problem, as in figure 15, 3, and paste it on the screen between him and the subject. He can then copy the pattern on the board out of view of the subject, and with a little practice can do it very expeditiously, often in less than 30 seconds. Test 6. Designs. Materials. The five plates of designs on page 143 to 152, E provides S with pencils and paper. Directions. The designs are given in order A, B, C, D. Formula for A and B. I am going to show you a drawing. You will have just 10 seconds to look at it, then I shall take it away and let you draw it from memory. Don't begin to draw till I say go. Formula for C and D. This time I shall show you two drawings. You will have only 10 seconds to look at them, then I shall take them away and you are to draw them both from memory. Before exposing the designs, E says, ready, look closely. When designs are removed, E says, go. Designs are exposed with greatest length of page horizontal and with front of guide towards E. The time limit is two minutes but S is not stopped or penalised if he appears to have the correct plan and is carrying it out. The raw score on A, B and C together is less than 3. D need not be given. Scoring. Emphasis is put upon reproduction of the plan of the designs rather than upon the neatness of the drawing. Credit as follows. A. 1. Two lines crossed. Four flags. 1. 2. Correctly facing one another. 1. 3. Accuracy, lines, nearly equal, nearly bisected, nearly at right angles, flags, nearly square, 1. Total possible points, 3. B. 1. Large square with two diameters, 1. 2. Four small squares within a large square, 1. 3. Two diameters in each small square, 1. 4. 16 dots, each alone in a small square, 1. 5. Accuracy of proportion, width of spaces around the four small squares between one quarter and one half the width of the sixteen small squares. 1. Figure 16, 4 is displayed on the following page. Design is complete, but with superfluous squares or lines, count only three points. Total possible points, 5. See figure 16, 4 for some common variations. Figure 16, 4 is displayed on the page. C1, a rectangle with approximately vertical lines. 1, dividing it approximately equally into not over 6 parts. 1, 2, dividing it into 4 parts. 1, 
Total possible points 2. C2. A rectangle with approximately vertical lines. 1. Dividing it into parts at least three of which diminish in size to right. 1. 2. Dividing it into six parts. 1. Total possible points 2. D1. 1. Large diamond with small diamond inside crosswise, with its vertices approximately coincident with obtuse angles of large diamond, or large diamond with small diamond inside with sides approximately parallel to those of large diamond. Alternative to 1. 1. 2. A third diamond with its vertices approximately coincident with the obtuse angles of the second. 1. 3. Accuracy. The proper lines very nearly parallel and the accurate angles of diamonds all nearly equal. 1. Total possible points, 3. D2. 1. A large square with sides approximately equal and small square inscribed. 1. 2. A third square inscribed in the second square approximately bisecting sides of second square. 1. Total possible points, 2. The maximum raw score for entire test, 17 points. Test 7. The Digit Symbol Test. Materials. See page 3 of record blank, page 290, this book. Directions. The part of the first row marked sample is used for demonstration. E says, you see these numbers and the little marks below each number, pointing to the row at the top of the page. Now I want you to put in each one of these squares, pointing to the empty square in the three rows, the little mark that ought to go there, like this. Below 2, put this little mark, beginning at 2 in the sample. Below 1, this. Below 3, this, etc. After doing five of the samples, E pauses and asks, Now, what should I put here? Indicating the next empty square. If S answers correctly, E finishes the sample himself. If S fails, E tells him and repeats the question with the next sample. After finishing the demonstration, E says, Now you begin here and fill as many squares as you can before I call time. Time, two minutes. Scoring. The score is the number of squares filled correctly in the time limit. Maximum raw score, 67 points. Test 8. The Maze Materials The four mazes A, B, C and D on page 4 of the record blank and maze A on page 3 for demonstration. Directions E shows S demonstration maze and says, You see these lines? Now I'm going to begin here at S and mark with my pencil the shortest way out without crossing any lines. Watch carefully. E places sheet so that the bottom of the maze is toward S and traces the way out, calling attention to the possibility of taking the wrong path at one or two of the critical points. E says, you see, if I should go this way, it would not be the shortest way out. I should have to turn back. E then presents test maze A on page four and says, now with your pencil begin at S and mark the shortest way out as quickly as you can. Do not cross any lines and do not turn back unless you have to. Ready, go ahead. If S crosses a line, not through carelessness, E says, you have crossed a line here. You see it is not an open space. Begin here, indicating a point on the pencil mark just before it crossed the line, and see if you can find a path out without crossing any lines. In scoring, S is penalised. One point for each line crossed as above. Mazes B, C and D should be presented in the same way as A except that no further demonstration is allowed. Time limit for each maze, 2 minutes. If the score on A and B is 0, the test may be discontinued. Figure 17, 5 is displayed on the page. Scoring. The time is recorded in seconds from start signal to successful exit. If this occurs within the time limit, credit for time is given for each maze as follows. Time, 0 to 20. Credit 3. 21 to 40. 2. 41 to 70. 1. 71 to 120. 0. Whether S finishes in the time limit or not, credit is given for the degree of success he has attained as follows. Each maze is divided into five successive steps, which are indicated by dotted lines crossing the path of the maze in the key maze. Figure 17.5. A credit of one point is given for each step successfully accomplished i.e. for each imaginary dotted line crossed, making a total of five points for each maze. The openings of all blind alleys are indicated by heavy brick lines across the path of the maze. A penalty of one point is given for each imaginary heavy line crossed. Thus the score equals the number of dotted lines crossed minus the number of heavy lines crossed, and maze lines crossed not through carelessness, see above. Any negative score thus obtained counts as zero. 
no matter how many times any dotted line or heavy line is crossed only one credit or penalty is given therefore maximum raw score 32 points test 9 picture arrangement materials five sets of foxy grandpa pictures figure 18 one set for demonstration and four for actual tests directions e presents demonstration on set x in a row in the order four two six three one five and says these pictures tell a funny story if they are placed in the right order e then proceeds to arrange the pictures properly telling the story as he does so and calling the subject's attention to the proper sequence of the important details he next removes this set and presents set a saying now see how quickly you can change these pictures around so as to make them tell a good story s is not told if he is wrong but e goes on to the next set sets b to d are presented in the same way the sets are shown in a row in the order four two six three one five and five one three six two four alternatively the time limit for each set is three minutes scoring e records the time and the arrangement for each set and gives a credit of one point for each pair of pictures in correct juxtaposition i e a maximum of five points for accuracy for each set when however the error in arrangement consists only in the reversal of one two or three juxtaposed pairs a penalty of one point is given for each such reversal thus a credit of four points is obtained for arrangement one two four three five six which would receive only two points credit for correctly juxtaposed pairs figure eighteen is displayed on the page materials for test nine picture arrangement this figure was not included in the examiner's guide no credit is given for time unless the arrangement is correct then credit as follows time one to thirty credit three thirty one to sixty credit two sixty one to one hundred twenty credit one one hundred twenty one to one hundred eighty credit zero maximum raw score thirty two points figure nineteen is displayed on the following page test ten Picture completion. Representing pictures to be completed, this figure was not included in the examiner's guide. Test 10. Picture completion. Materials. Two boards upon which are depicted successive scenes from the day's activity of a boy and 60 small blocks from which are selected the pieces to complete the pictures. Figure 19. Figure 20 is displayed on the page. Test 10. Picture completion. Representing the pictures from which selection is made. This figure was not included in the examiner's guide. Directions. The boards are placed before S, part 2 at his right. The 60 small pieces are placed above the boards, in the box arranged in a predetermined order as indicated in the box. In this arrangement, ambiguous pieces are located in the same area. E says, here is a picture. It begins here, pointing to demonstration picture, where the boy is getting dressed. It shows the same boy, remember, the very same boy, doing one thing after another during the same day. E points along first row and then along second to indicate the sequence in which the pictures come. You see in each picture a piece is missing. The value of minus 5 is to be given to all placings where in the table below no numbers are inserted. These represent the marked absurdities. A table is displayed on the page, value of pieces in pictures. Here are a lot of small pieces. They go into the empty places. You are to pick out the piece that you think is needed that is best to make the picture right. For example, what is gone here, pointing demonstration picture? If S answers correctly, E says, that's fine. Now see if you can find the best piece for each of the other places. If S does not answer correctly, E finds the piece for him, explains why it is right, and then says, now see, etc., as above. E gives no help after the first explanation, but S is allowed to change pieces if he wishes. When S indicates that he is finished as well as he can, time is recorded. The time limit is 10 minutes. Another table is displayed on the previous page. The value of pieces and pictures. The value of minus 5 is to be given to all placings where in the table below no numbers are inserted. These represent the marked absurdities. There are 11 columns descending down the table with pieces and Roman numerals to indicate the remaining columns. Scoring. No credit is given for time, but the very slow are indirectly penalised for not finishing in the time limit. The scoring of the performance is indicated in the accompanying table. When a square is left unfilled, the scoring for that item is zero. Negative score on the entire test counts as zero. Maximum raw score 100. B. 
Procedure for non-English speaking subjects. He should take care that his directions do not appear too artificial. For this reason, he should not always remain absolutely silent. He should try to use whatever words are intelligible to his subject. No, yes, hurry, etc. can be used in most cases, and even when S does not understand, it is often better for E to speak as well as gesture. The aim here is only to make the instructions intelligible apart from the language used. Test 1. The Ship Test E shows S the frame with the pieces properly fitted therein. After X looks at picture for 10 seconds, E withdraws picture, removes pieces and presents the empty frame and the pieces arranged as in figure 13, 1. E points in order to S, to the pieces, to the frame, and nods affirmatively. If S does not understand, E repeats. Test 2. Mannequin and Feature Profile E places pieces before S as previously described then points to S, to pieces, nods affirmatively, and sweeps hands together over pieces to indicate that they are to be assembled. This may be repeated. If S does not understand, or if pieces are not properly assembled in the time limit, E demonstrates part A and goes on to B. Test 3. Cube Imitation E places the cube board before S as previously described, then taps the first imitation problem slowly, puts down the tapping cube, points to S and nods affirmatively. If S fails to understand, E repeats. If he begins at the wrong end, E shakes head negatively, points to the first cube, and repeats the problem. E should make sure he has subject's attention before tapping any problem. Test 4. Cube Construction A. E presents Model 1 and the corresponding blocks, points to bottom, top, and sides of model, then places it upon the table and assembles the blocks rather slowly turning over each block in the fingers and pointing to painted and unpainted sides. E now presents the same model and the blocks in regular order, then points in order to S, to the model, to the blocks, and nods affirmatively. E repeats, if S does not understand. B. E presents model 2 with the same nine blocks for its construction, shows S, bottom, top, and sides of model, then places it upon the table, points to S, to the model, to the blocks, and nods affirmatively. E repeats gestures if S does not understand. C. E presents model 3, turns it over slowly, showing each side, presents blocks, picks up a block, points to painted side, shakes head, points to one painted side, nods, puts down block, points to S, to model, and to blocks, nods affirmatively. Test 5. Form board. E places board before S as previously described. Points to square and to empty spaces, and proceeds slowly to change blocks and put in square. E next removes board, rearranges it for problem A, and again presents it to S. He then points to S, to square and to board, nodding affirmatively. If S does not understand, E repeats gestures, and if problem is not solved in the time limit, he again demonstrates the correct solution and passes on to B. Problems B and C presented in the same way except that they are not demonstrated in case of S's failure. Test 6. Designs. E shows S demonstrational design, X, for 10 seconds. Then he takes it away and draws it for S. He now shows test design, A, for 10 seconds, then takes it away, gives S pencil and paper, points to S, to paper, nods affirmatively. If S does not respond, E draws it for him, then passes on to B. Designs B, C, and D are presented in the same way except that E does not demonstrate further. Test 7. Digit symbol. E shows S the record sheet, points to blank below 2 in the sample. Then to sample for 2 at top of page, writes in symbol, proceeds in the same way with the other parts of the sample, then gives S pencil, points to space below 3 in the test and nods affirmatively. Test 8. The maze. E shows S demonstration maze A, with his pencil proceeds to trace the shortest way out. At critical points he hesitates, moves pencil in wrong direction without marking shakes his head, and continues to work in the right direction. He next presents test maze A, gives S pencil, points to starting point, and to exit of maze, and nods affirmatively. If S fails to understand, E demonstrates again with maze A and passes on to B. Mazes B, C, and D are presented in the same way, but no more demonstration is given. Test 9. Picture Arrangement E presents demonstrational set and allows S to see it for about 15 seconds. Then making sure that S is attending, he slowly rearranges the picture and points to each one in succession, attracting subjects' attention especially in the sequence of important details. 
Next, E removes these pictures and presents set A, points to S, and moves his hand about the pictures to indicate that they are to be arranged. If S does not understand, E shows him the proper arrangement and then goes on to set B. Sets B, C, and D are presented in the same way as A, except that no further demonstration is given if S fails. Test 10. Picture Completion E places material before S as previously described. He then slowly points to the same boy in each of the pictures in succession to indicate the proper sequence of events. He next returns to the demonstrational picture, points to dressed and undressed foot and to empty space. Next he looks leisurely over the small blocks, tries the slipper or the low shoe in the space, points to dressed foot and shakes his head negatively. Then he puts in the correct piece showing satisfaction with result. Finally he points in order to picture 1 to S to small blocks and to the empty space in the picture and nods affirmatively. If S does not understand, he repeats. C. Directions for using record blank. In general, the subject is given credit for both speed and accuracy, or degree of success, and the record blank is designed to convert time and accuracy measurements into points of credit without delay or inconvenience. As soon as S has completed tests 1, 2, 4, 5, 8, or 9, or any part or any one of them, E checks the space containing the figures which include the subject's time. In tests 1 and 2 and 9, he next scores the performance for accuracy, and if the conditions for crediting time are fulfilled, he adds the credit below the time checked to the credit for accuracy and records a sum in the column marked score. In tests 4 and 5, E also checks the space which includes the number of moves, and if the conditions for crediting are fulfilled, he adds the credit below time checked to the credit below moves checked and records a sum in the column marked score, as above. In test 8, time is checked and the credit for time added to the credit for success, etc., as before. The abbreviations T, L, in the tests, means time limit. And this space is checked only when S is actually stopped before the test or part of the test is completed. In test 3, E records the response only when it is incorrect, but always writes plus or minus in the proper column. In test 10, the number on the back of the block selected for a given picture is written below the number of the picture, and the credit for that part is written in the next space below. If no block is selected for any given picture, E leaves that space blank. Tests 6 and 7 require no explanation. The score for each part of the tests, 2, 4, 5, 8 and 9, are written in the column marked score, and then these part scores are total below the heavy line, except in test 2, where the total for the two parts is merely written at the foot of the space for score. In all other tests, only the total score for the test is written in the score column. D. Directions for weighing performance scale scores. The raw score for each of the ten tests is converted into a weighted or equalized score, which is entered on the performance scale record blank and on the psychological record card in the column headed weighted score. This weighted score is obtained by means of the accompanying table. In the table, all the possible raw scores for each test are listed in columns bearing the number of the test. The weighted scores corresponding are listed in the columns under the letter W at either side of the page. For example, to convert a raw score into test 1 into a weighted score, look at the column under figure 1, find the raw score, and take the score in either column W, which is on the same line. Thus, the weighted score corresponding to the raw score 19 in test 1 is 13. The weighted score corresponding to the raw score 35 in test 7 is 15, etc. A table is displayed on the page, the table for weighting performance scale scores. E. An abbreviated performance scale. If time does not permit the giving of the complete performance scale, a short scale selected from tests 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7 and 8 may be used. These tests must be given in the following order, 7, 6, 2, 4, 8, 1, 3, or 3, 1. After each test is given, E should compute the weighted score obtained by S up to that point, and he may discontinue the examination after the first test. If the score is 14 or more after the second, if it is 22 after the third, if it is 27 and after the fourth, if it is 32. The fifth test should be given if the score on four tests is less than 32, but only very rarely need more than five tests being used. If S is absolutely illiterate, whether American or foreign-born, E should begin with test 6 instead of 7 and follow the same procedure. 
If the examination is discontinued after the first test, S should be rated D, C- if the score is 21 or more, and as a rule recommended for regular service. If two or more tests are given, a final score should be attained by finding the average for the tests actually given and multiplying by 10. The letter rating for this score can then be read from the table of norms for the short scale. If eight or more tests are given, the norms for the long scale should be used. F. Expressing and interpreting results. The results of the performance scale examination should be expressed in the following ways. 1. Total weighted score. 2. Letter rating. 3. Mental age. The letter ratings corresponding to various scores in mental ages are as follows. A table is displayed on the page with three columns, complete scale, short scale, and mental age all descending down the page. Letter ratings should be assigned as follows. A small table is displayed with three columns, with the letter rating, the complete scale, and the short scale descending down the page. Grade E should be given to all men who are recommended by the examiner for discharge, development battalion, or service organization, and to such men only. All men whose intelligence is deemed satisfactory for regular military duty shall be given rating of D- minus or higher. Subjects obtaining a score of 100 points or more, short scale, may ordinarily be recommended for regular military training. Subjects obtaining 40 to 99 points should be considered for assignment to service organization or development battalion. Those below 40 points should ordinarily be considered for discharge. 5. Mechanical skill test. The mechanical test is intended for use 1. In aiding decision in doubtful cases under individual consideration, and 2. As a special test of mechanical skill. Materials. 1. Set mechanical test. Steinquist. Single series 1. Instructions. Place the open box before S, with the cover towards him. Say, here are some things that have been taken apart. You are to put them together. Begin here, pointing to A. Take the parts and put them together so that the thing will work. Then go on to this one, pointing to B, and to the next, and so on. If you come to one that seems very hard, go on to the next one, and if there is time later, try it again. The more things you get done, the larger your score. Ready, go. Time for the entire test, 30 minutes. Scoring. Give 10 points for the complete and correct assembling of each object. Total possible score, 100. If the assembling of any object is only partially correct, give partial credit according to the schedule. A list of the possible steps in the assembling is given for each object. Note, in each case of partial solution, which steps have been completed and give credit for each step as indicated. The items included in a brace are alternative reactions. Therefore, give credit of only one number of points from any brace. It will be noted in D, for example, that failing only to screw cover on, S gets but six points, while screwing the cover on counts but one point. The additional three points of penalty are for lack of workability. If any step is omitted in the solution of any object except E, then item of workability is considered as lacking. In E, however, credit of two points is given for workability if the solution is correct except only two sides snapped or caps out of order or both. In case of the lock, the spring is properly inserted when the bend is hooked over the projection in the frame to prevent slipping. By spring inserted workably, is meant one of the three other workable positions in which it is possible to place a spring, but which make no use of the bend. In the case of the mouse trap, by in slot is meant that the long arm of the spring is inserted in the slot of the U-shaped band. By right way, reference is made to the direction in which the U-shaped band snaps. A weak snap is occasioned by having the spring or springs inverted. If one spring is more nearly correctly inserted than the other, count best one. That is, give credit for the best spring and for that only, except in the last case. A schedule of scores is displayed on the following two pages. A. Head inserted correctly. 2. Nut screwed on, properly between crossbars of handle. 4. Otherwise, 1. Score, wrench. Parenthesis. B. Complete chain of single jointed links. 3. One correct joint between links. 2. Two correct joints. 4. 3 correct joints, 6, 4 correct joints, 8, score, chain, parenthesis. C. Numb lever inserted in armholes, below spring, arm of lever out, 3, above spring, wrong side forward, 8, score, tube shut off, 
Parenthesis. D. Thumb lever on pin either way. 1. Gear on pin right side up in mesh with lever. 1. Knockers right side up in mesh with gear. 2. Cover screwed on. 1. Spring hooked. 2. Score. Bell. Parenthesis. E. Center stud in place. 2. Springs in place. 1. Caps in place. Out of order. 1. In order. 3. Cover snapped. 2 sides. 1. 3 sides. 2. Workability. 2. Score. Coin box. Parenthesis. F. Spring correctly placed on one stick. 2. Imperfect usable close pin. Unsymmetrical. 4. Symmetrical. 6. Score. Close pin. Parenthesis. G. Small lever in place. 2. Lock bolts in place. 1. Spring inserted. Workability. 4. Properly. 5. Top fitted on properly and screwed inserted. 1. Score lock. Parenthesis. H. Both levers backward. 1. One forward clear in other backward. 3. Other part way in forward. 4. Both way in forward. 5. Both clear in forward. 1. Facing long. 8. Both facing long. 9. Score, paperclip, parenthesis. I. Button properly inserted in upper ring. 2. Circuit closing disc properly fitted in bottom ring. 2. Ring snapped together. 3. Score, electric button, parenthesis. J. U-shaped band held in proper place by pin or wire. 1. Trim lever on pin. Improperly 1. Properly 2. Wire lever hooked. Improperly 1. Properly 2. Springs on pin. Count best 1. Weak snap, not in slot either way, 1. Weak snap, in slot either way, 2. Strong snap, in slot, long way, 3. Strong snap, in slot, right way on spring, 4. Both springs, 5. Score, mousetrap, parenthesis. Abbreviated Mechanical Test The abbreviated mechanical test includes only items A, B, D, E and G of the complete test. Time, 15 minutes. Score each item according to directions given above and double their sum to secure the total score. Table of norms, derived from 990 cases, 303rd Engineers Camp Dix. A table is displayed on the page with two columns of score and percentile rank in percent. There is also an additional table with two columns of letter rating and score. Appendix A. Table of equivalent scores is displayed on the page with alpha, beta, point scale, complete performance, short performance, and Stanford Binet. Additional tables also displayed for the basis for the assignment of letter grades. The table has six columns descending with alpha, beta, point scale, whole performance, short performance, and Stanford Binet, with a comparison of A, B, C plus, C, C minus, D, and D minus. Appendix B, Examiner's Outfit. 1. A supplementary outfit is furnished at the commencement of camp examining to provide for the immediate needs of the staff. This outfit includes 1. 6 gross lead pencils 2. 3 pencil sharpeners 3. 2 typewriters 4. 2 typewriter tables 5. 1 chest of tools Additions to and replenishment of these materials must be secured regularly from the medical supply officer by requisition through the division or camp surgeon. 2. Psychological equipment, as such, consists of three groups. A. Group examining outfit. B. Individual examining outfit. C. Printed materials. The regular procedure for increasing or replacing these supplies is a request through military channels addressed to the Surgeon General of the Army, Attention Division of Psychology. The various items under psychological equipment are listed below. A. Group examining. 1. Beta outfit. A. Blackboard frame. B. Beta chart. C. Six cardboard pieces, test seven. Two, alpha stencils for each form. Three, beta stencils. B, individual examining. One, point scale materials. Two, Stanford Binet materials. Three, performance scale materials. A, ship test. B, mannequin. C, feature profile. D, cube construction. E, cube imitation. F, form board. G, picture arrangement. H, picture completion. 4. Mechanical skill test. C. Printed materials. 1. Group examination alpha, 5 forms. 2. Group examination beta. 3. Point scale examination. 4. Stanford Binet examination. 5. 
Performance scale examination. 6. Psychological record. 7. Report of psychological examination. 8. Examiner's guide. Appendix C. Building and equipment. Following authorization by the Secretary of War for the construction in each camp of special psychology building, it was decided to secure, wherever possible, the assignment of small barracks building and to remodel the same for psychological use. Suitable building for psychological examining has been designated in many of the divisional training camps. In others, temporary arrangements have been effected. For the use of the School of Military Psychology, Medical Officers Training Camp, Fort Oglethorpe, GA, a special psychology building has been constructed. In general, it is desirable that building for psychological examining be located conveniently near receiving and examining station of camp, and if possible, also near the personal office of the office of the camp surgeon and psychiatrist. Where there is a depot brigade, the building should be either in or near the same. Since the psychologist will have important functions in connection with the development battalion, it also should be considered in selecting location for psychological work. For information of examiners and their guidance in selecting and planning for the remodeling of such building as they may secure for their work, the plans of special psychology building are reproduced herewith. In planning modifications for any assigned building, it is well to keep in mind the fact that other uses than psychological examining will be found for the psychological building. In the original plan, it was intended that the Division of Psychiatry should also have an office in the building, and where necessary, sufficient examining space for individual examinations and consultation. In certain of the camp's plans are already on foot to use this building for medical conferences, for conferences between psychiatrists, psychologists, and line officers, for addresses to the line officers on morale, and for discussions and conferences on methods of instruction and training of the new recruit. The first floor of the original building was planned to contain alpha and beta examining rooms and a store room for heavy materials. The alpha examining room was planned to seat on the floor 160 to 200 men. This room was without benches, but the necessary space for each man is marked out roughly by lines running crosswise of the length of the room. These lines were spaced three feet apart. Since the men were to be seated on the floor or on small wicker mats, it was deemed desirable to make the floor of this room of double thickness. A small reading stand with shelves was planned for the large examining room. The small examining room or beta room was planned to seat between 60 and 100 men. A bench designed for this room with its partitions and other measurements is shown in figure 23, 8. It was also deemed desirable to have in this room a raised platform about 18 inches high from which the demonstrations could be more easily seen from the back of the room. A bank of lights so arranged as to illuminate the beta blackboard will be found essential on cloudy days. Cross lights should be avoided. Lights in alpha rooms should barely clear the tallest men. The storeroom should have built-in shelves sufficient to enable the examiner to unpack at least one week's supply of the necessary examining materials. Similar shelves should be planned for the scoring room, record room, office and small storeroom. Shelves in the record room can be made wider than usual shelving, so that if long narrow boxes are built to contain the record cards, they may be placed lengthwise across these shelves. Other necessary changes are indicated on the plan. A certain amount of furniture, either built by the construction quartermaster or supplied through the camp quartermaster upon requisition, is indicated in the plan. Examiners should have on hand at least 250 strips of beaver board 12 by 18 inches, wicker mats for the alpha examining room, if possible, and a sufficient supply of wall hooks for overcoats and hats of those being examined. Each of the individual rooms on the second floor should be supplied with small tables. In addition, about 20 small tables, 3 by 6 feet, 30 inches high, are needed in the scoring room. According to the desire of the examiner, these tables may be supplied with special scoring tops as indicated in the specifications and plan in figure 23.8. For the regular work of the examining staff and scores, at least 75 ordinary chairs should be sufficient. On the preceding pages, figure 21, 6, first floor plan, figure 22, 7, second floor plan, and figure 23, 8, bench in small examining room, table in scoring room. This is a brief description of the building and equipment as originally planned for the psychological examining staff. It is obvious that no one of the buildings already constructed can be adapted to meet these suggestions exactly. 
the original plan and equipment are presented here as suggestions rather than as essential in all details. It is essential that the individual examining be done under as uniform conditions as possible. It is necessary that the chief examiner have a definite address and office within the camp boundaries, and it is further essential that proper storage space be furnished and supplied with locks or guards to protect against loss of examining materials. It is also necessary for accurate scoring and recording that permanent and sufficient floor space be supplied for the scoring unit. Outside these essential and necessary requirements are the expendable equipment necessary to carry on the examining, scoring and recording, physical properties will vary considerably from camp to camp. Additional diagrams for tests are also included in the following pages. End of chapter 3「4 of Army Mental Tests」by Clarence Yoakum and Robert Yerkes This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 4 – Army Tests in the Students' Army Training Corps and Colleges The form of the examiner's guide prepared by Major Lewis M. Terman for use in the Students' Army Training Corps differs slightly in directions for its use and the method of giving instructions to the subjects for all separate tests except one. The instructions were not read aloud to those taking the tests. The time limits, in consequence, were changed slightly to include a portion of the reading time. All other cautions and directions are identical with those of the regular army guide. It was unnecessary to prepare tests for literate and effectives, since the early plans for the corps did not include instruction for the non-English speaking men at the draft age. The form containing the essential changes is reproduced here. Introductory Statement The instructions presented herewith are for the conduct of Examination Alpha, the intelligence test prepared especially for literate men in the Army. With minor exceptions, the procedure is the same as that used with other literate recruits. The purposes of the Alpha examination in the Students' Army Training Corps are a. to secure an objective rating for all students according to general intelligence, as an aid in their final classification for service, b. to acquaint prospective officers with the nature and value of the psychological ratings which are in general use in the Army, c. to aid in the educational guidance of students, d. where the examination can be given at the opening of a new term to aid in the selection of candidates for admission. When the examination cannot be given as part of the entrance requirements, it should be given as early as possible after the opening of a new term. The results, if promptly available, will be of value both in the educational guidance of the students and in the evaluation of their work. In order to eliminate all possibility of coaching, the following precautions should be taken. 1. Different forms of the Alpha Examination booklet should be used in successive terms. In general, it will be advised not to use a given form more than once in a school year of four quarters. 2. The examinations in a given school should be completed in the shortest possible time. In the smaller schools, all the students may ordinarily be examined in the same half day and the larger schools in one or at most two days. 3. The greatest care should be taken to prevent the dissemination of examination booklets. Before the men are allowed to leave the room after an examination, the number of booklets collected should be carefully checked against the number distributed. Used blanks and blanks held in reserve should be safeguarded by the examiner according to directions furnished by the Regional Director of Psychology Tests. The number of men who should be examined in a group will be determined largely by the available space. Groups of 100 to 200 men are preferable, but under suitable conditions, groups of 300 or 400 are readily handled. Crowding, however, should be avoided. When circumstances will permit, the men should be assigned to alternate seats. It is necessary that some kind of support be provided for the booklets. If there is no suitable room, which is fitted with desks or with chairs having armrests, then each student may be supplied with a book on which to rest the examination blank during the examination. While discipline must be preserved throughout the examination, it is necessary that the men be made to feel at ease. Statements which might cause apprehension or nervousness should be avoided. Generally speaking, Little should be said by the examiner beyond giving the directions for the separate tests. 
The procedure as set forth in the following pages should be adhered to rigidly. The directions should be given in the exact words indicated. No supplementary instruction of any kind are permissible. The rule that no questions shall be asked should be strictly enforced. Each test should be timed with a stopwatch. Care should be exercised to avoid error in timing. A few extra pencils, sharpened, should be at hand to supply men who need a new one during the examination. Pencil, not pen, should be used in all cases. After the men have been seated, each is given a pencil. Then, E, examiner, should say, We are going to pass around some papers now. Don't turn any of the pages until I tell you to. Alpha booklets are then distributed face up, the greatest care being taken to see that no one is given more than one booklet. As soon as the booklets have been distributed, E should continue, slowly and distinctly, pausing after each instruction to give subjects time to respond. Now, at the top of the page, print your name after the word name. Print your last name first, then your first name, and then your middle initial, if any. After name has been written, say, put your age and years after each word. Age. Pause. Next, in the third line, write the name of the state or country in which you were born. If you were not born in this country, tell the number of years you have lived in the United States. Pause. After the word race, write the word white. In examining Negro groups, substitute the word Negro. Next, go to the line that begins with the word schooling and draw a line under the highest school grade you were attended before you entered the SATC. For example, if the last grade you attended before you entered the SATC was the fourth year of high school or preparatory school, draw a line under high school, year four. If you had reached the second year of college before entering the SATC, draw a line under college, year two, etc. When everything is ready, E proceeds as follows. Attention. The purpose of this examination is to see how well you can remember, think and carry out what you are told to do. It is a test of general mental ability and it will help to find out what you are best fitted to do in the army. Such tests are given to all enlisted men in the army. The results have proved to be of great value. The grade you make in this examination will be put in your qualification card and will become a part of your permanent record. Some of the things you will be given to do are very easy. Some you may find hard. You are not expected to make a perfect grade, but do the very best you can. In the army, a man often has to listen to commands and then carry them out exactly. I am going to give you some commands to see how well you can carry them out. Listen closely. Ask no questions. Do not watch any other man to see what he does. Look at your papers. Just below where you have been writing, there are several sets of forms, circles, triangles, and so forth. First, you'll be told to do something with the circles at one, afterwards with the circles at two, and so on. When I call attention, stop instantly whatever you are doing and hold your pencils up, so. Don't put your pencils down to the paper until I say, go. Examiner lowers his pencil. Listen carefully to what I say. Do just what you are told to do. As soon as you are through, pencils up. Remember, wait for the word go. NB Examiner Give the following instructions very distinctly and at a moderate pace. After giving the command attention, always notice carefully and have orderlies notice whether all pencils are up. Never proceed until they are. This is especially important in the beginning. Be careful to use the directions that fit the form of alpha booklet distributed. Be careful not to pause or to drop the voice in the course of a compound direction, e.g. in two before the words and also. Raise your pencils whenever you say attention. Lower it promptly whenever you say go. Instructions for test one in each form are exactly the same as in the original guide. When the examiner is through giving the directions for test one, he says, during the rest of the examination, don't turn any page forward or backwards until you are told to. Now turn up the page to test two. Test 2. Arithmetical Problems Attention. Read the directions at the top of the page and do what they tell you to do. I will say stop at the end of 5 minutes. Do as many as you can in the time allowed. Ready? Go. After 5 minutes, say stop. Turn over the page to Test 3. Test 3. Practical Judgment Attention. Read the directions at the top of the page and do what they tell you to do. Ready? Go. After one minute of 40 seconds, say stop. 
Turn over the page to test four. Test four. Synonym, antonym. Attention. Read the directions at the top of the page and do what they tell you to do. Ready? Go. After one minute and forty seconds, say, stop. Turn over the page to test five. Pause. Now you have to turn your books around this way. Examiner illustrates the necessary rotation. Test 5. Disarrange sentences. Attention. Read the directions at the top of the page and do what they tell you to do. Ready? Go. After 2 minutes and 10 seconds, say stop. Turn over the page to test 6. Test 6. Number series completion. Attention. Read the samples and the directions at the top of the page and do what the directions tell you to do. Ready? Go. After 3 minutes and 10 seconds, say stop. Turn over the page to test 7. Test 7. Analogies. Attention. Look at the first sample at the top of the page. Sky blue. Grass, table, green, warm, big. Notice the four words in heavy type. One of them, green, is underlined. Grass is green, just as the sky is blue. Look at the second sample. Fish swims. Man, paper, time, walks, girl. Here the word walks is underlined. A man walks and a fish swims. Look at the third sample, day, night. White, red, black, clear, pure. Here the word black is underlined because black is the opposite of white, just as night is the opposite of day. In each of the lines below, the first two words are related to each other in some way. What you are to do in each line is to see what the relation is between the first two words and underline the word in heavy type that is related in the same way to the third word. Begin with number one and mark as many sets as you can before time is called. Ready, go. After three minutes, say stop. Turn over the page to test eight. Test eight. Information. Attention. Read the directions at the top of the page and do what they tell you to do. Ready, go. After four minutes, say stop. Close your booklets and turn them over to test one. Have all examination booklets and pencils collected immediately and before the men are allowed to leave their seats. Before dismissing the group, the number of booklets collected should be carefully checked with the number of men present and the number of booklets issued. Directions for scoring. The scoring is done by means of stencils, one for each of the eight tests. A test is scored by placing the stencil upon the appropriate page of the record booklet and comparing the responses given with the marks on the stencil. The stencils may be made of cardboard suitably marked to indicate the correct answer. For tests 4, 5, 7 and 8, stencils made of thin transparent strips of celluloid are preferable. If celluloid cannot be obtained, stencils for these tests may be made of cardboard. In this case, the scoring of tests 7 and 8 will be facilitated by perforating the cardboard stencils so as to show where the correct responses are located. Letter ratings A, B, C+, etc., together with the total score earned in the mental test, should be recorded promptly on each student's qualification card. Detailed instructions for the use of mental ratings in the SATC will be supplied separately. A few days after authority to administer the general intelligence test to the SATC was granted, the armistice was signed. Personal plans were delayed until the future status of the Students' Army Training Corps could be determined. The general considerations that led the committee to offer the colleges the opportunity to use the Army tests, notwithstanding the sudden disappearance of the military necessity, are summed up in the following memorandum prepared by Major Terman. In the first place, the tests will furnish an extremely valuable check upon the work of the students. There is no other means of ascertaining, so definitely, whether the student is working up to the limits of his abilities. Without a knowledge of the quality of the student's ability, there is no means of appraising his efforts. Over and over, both in high school and college, I have seen students of A, intelligence, but poor performance, stimulated as a result of the test to improve their work. On the other hand, it is by no means uncommon for an unsuccessful student to be blamed by his instructor, when in fact the cause of his failure is inferior ability rather than lack of effort. Without a knowledge of the quality of its raw material, a school has to work more or less in the dark. The test would also be valuable as an aid in the educational guidance of students. Men will be found attempting work in lines for which their native ability does not fit them. Such students will be everlastingly benefited by being guided into other lines 
more nearly commensurate with their ability. The experience with the tests in the SATC will undoubtedly be of value if the military situation should ever again become acute, or if this should not happen, they would be of value in connection with a future military training, wherever this might be given. I believe that the value of the tests for military purposes have been sufficiently demonstrated, and that they will play a part in all future educational institutions giving military training. The test will be a valuable experiment for the colleges, apart from present or future military considerations, although we shall perhaps not be justified in emphasizing this argument. The Division of Tests of the Committee on Education and Special Training finally decided to offer the materials to the colleges. A circular letter was sent to the colleges containing this information, and they were requested to state in reply whether they desired to use the test material and to designate a member of the faculty who would assume responsibility for receiving the blanks and instructions and directing the administration of the tests. Approximately 100 favourable replies were received almost immediately, and instructions and materials were sent. Before the order demobilising the corps was issued, 209 schools and colleges had indicated their willingness to cooperate in the use of the tests, some of the data thus obtained below. Data from Colleges and the Students' Army Training Corps Data resulting from giving the Alpha examination to the Students' Army Training Corps and to college groups are of interest as bearing upon the intelligence of such groups and upon the position of these groups on the scale of Alpha scores. Caution is necessary in the interpretation of the data of the tables. It is by no means certain that the values given are typical of the groups which they represent. The institutions from which the data were obtained are largely the smaller schools and colleges of the Western South. Few data are at hand from the larger universities, and the record suggests that inclusions of figures from a number of large universities of high standing would materially raise the medians and the percentage of higher ratings. It cannot be stated with certainty that the groups to which the examination were given were truly representative of the institutions. There are from Brown University, for instance, records of only 210 men. This group is such a small proportion of the total registration that the chances are very much against it being a representative group. At some of the institutions, the tests were given only to those who volunteered to take them, a procedure which introduces a factor of selection. Sometimes the records were obtained from only one class. Such a limitation probably gives a selected group. The figures from the University of Illinois show distinct class differences. A third factor making for variability in the results is the fact that the tests were given under widely varying conditions and by many examiners, most of whom were untrained. Whilst the chances of variations on this cause are not large, the possibility of such variations must be held in mind while examining the figures. Table 2 shows the distribution of alpha scores in several of the larger groups, and Table 3 the median scores, quartiles and percentages of A and B grades for the groups listed in the table. There are wide differences between these groups. The medians vary from 111 for the normal school women to 130 for the college men, and the percentage of A and B grades combined for the same groups varies from 57.4 to 75.2. None of the groups makes a record as high as that of the army officers chosen for the principal sampling for holorith analysis, but all groups rate higher than the army surgeons who made 50% of A and B grades. The men of the Students' Army Training Corps and the Reserve Officers' Training Corps seem to offer good material for the selection of officers for the Army. Table 2 is displayed on the page. Distribution of alpha scores for various groups from educational institutions. A series of columns is descending, with the score range 15 SATC men, 3 ROTC men, 30 colleges men, 4 normal schools men, 13 colleges, women, 7 normal schools, women, all colleges, men and women. Table 3 is displayed on the page. Summary. Median alpha scores, quartiles and percentages of A and B grades made by various groups from educational institutions. The table is a series of columns going across the page and also going down. Going down, there is college men, college women, college men and women combined, SATC men, ROTC men, Normal school men, normal school women, white officers, principal sampling. Across the page, the columns read as median, lower quartile, upper quartile, percent of A's, percent of A's and B's, number of cases, and number of institutions.
In Table 4, an analysis is made of the records of five units of the Students' Army Training Corps, which included more than 100 men. Here again, wide differences are apparent. Table 4 is displayed on the page. Students' Army Training Groups. Median alpha scores, quartiles, and percentages of A and B grades made by various Students' Army Training Corps groups. The categories listed are Dartmouth, K School Cleveland, University of California, University of Texas, College of Worcester, Ohio, 15 SATCs combined, White Officers Principal Sampling. Two of the groups of the Reserve Officers Training Corps were made up of more than 100 men each, and these two groups are combined in Table 5. There is a difference of 10 points in the median scores and a difference of 18.5% in the number of A and B grades obtained. Table 5 is displayed on the page. Reserve Officers Training Corps Median Alpha Scores, Quartiles and Percentages of A and B Grades made by various Reserve Officers Training Corps groups. The categories listed are The Citadel, Charleston, SC, Virginia Polytechnic Institute, three ROTCs combined, White Officers Principal Sampling. The figures for various groups of college men are presented in Table 6. Here the differences are even more striking. For the median range, all the way from 80 to 150, while the percentages of A and B grades run from 17.4 to 95.5. Several colleges presented here a better record than that made by the white officers in the principal sampling. Table 6. College Men Median alpha scores, quartiles and percentages of A and B grades made by various groups of college men is displayed on the page. In the column descending, the categories are Massachusetts Agricultural College, Rutgers, Brown University, Colorado College, John Hopkins Freshman, Notre Dame, University of Minnesota, Freshman, Southern Methodist University, University of Idaho, University of Florida, Lincoln Memorial, Tennessee, Atlanta Southern Dental College, 20 colleges combined, White Officers Principal Sampling. The data for the women from various colleges, shown in Table 7, again emphasize the differences between institutions. The variations are not so great as they were in the case of the college men, but they are large enough to be significant. Table 7 is displayed on the page, College Women. Median alpha scores, quartiles and percentages of A and B grades made by various groups of college women. The categories listed down the page are Colorado College, University of Minnesota Freshman, University of North Dakota, State Teachers College, Colorado, Southern Methodist University, University of Idaho, 13 colleges combined. None of the normal schools reported records of enough men to make a study of the differences worthwhile. But the fact that there are large differences between normal schools as well as between colleges is shown in Table 8, which gives the results of four groups of normal school women. Table 8 is displayed on the page. Normal school women. Median alpha scores, quartiles and percentages of A and B grades made by various groups of normal school women. Categories listed down the page are 1st District, Missouri, Peru, Nebraska, Millersville, Pennsylvania, Sam Houston, Texas, Seven normals combined. In Table 9, the division is by sex. While the median scores made by the women are in every case a few points lower than the median scores for men in similar groups, the differences are so small that they may be regarded as insignificant. The same statement may be made regarding the percentage of A and B grades combined. The men tend towards a higher proportion of A grades. Table 9 is displayed on the page. Sex. Intelligence ratings according to sex. Categories listed across the page are Colorado College, University of Minnesota Freshman, Southern Methodist University, University of Idaho Colleges Combined, Normal Schools Combined. As the data sent by the University of Illinois were grouped according to the Department of Study, it was possible to investigate possible intelligence differences between the various departments. These data are set forth in Table 10, as would be expected. The graduate students rate considerably higher than the students in the undergraduate departments, but this is the only difference of importance. The very slight drop for the students of agriculture is probably not significant. Table 10 is displayed on the page. Departments within a university. Intelligence ratings of students in various departments of the University of Illinois. Categories listed down the page are Literature, Arts and Sciences, Commerce, Agriculture, Engineering, Graduates. Differences between the men in the four years of college were also obtained from the Illinois data. The results are shown in Table 11. There is a slight but definite increase in the percentage of higher grades with the lowest day at college, presumably as a result of elimination of poorer men. 
Table 11 is displayed on the page. College class. Intelligence grades according to university class of students at the University of Illinois. The categories listed down the page are freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. The table is divided across the page with intelligence grades of C-, C, C+, C B, A, A and B, and number of cases. The chart reproduced on page 36, figure 10, is of interest in connection with possible uses of such examinations in our high schools and higher institutions of learning. All of the students had been selected because they were judged by their commanding officers to have the necessary qualifications for success as army officers. They were believed to have the necessary physique, leadership, ability, intelligence, initiative, and responsibility. The following discussion of tests in colleges is quoted from an article by Lieutenant Colonel W. V. Brigham in the Proceedings of the American Association of College Registrars for 1919. These men were all given the Army Intelligence Examination. The results were grouped according to Army standards into the grades A, B, C+, plus, C, C-, minus, D, D-, minus, D, but there was none who scored D-, minus, or E. Of those who scored C- minus, or D, about seven-eighths failed to get through the course of training. Of those who scored C, about one-half succeeded and one-half failed. Of those who scored A or B, about eight and nine succeeded. In other words, intelligence, while by no means the only factor in determining their success in the officers' training schools, was enough of a factor, so that even with such a rough tool of measurement as the Army Intelligence Examination, it was possible to predicate with some certainty that anyone who scored C, C- minus, or D was probably wasting his time in going to an officer's training school. Another chart, page 34 of figure 8, illustrates the tremendous inequalities of ability in various companies within a single regiment when the men were assigned to the companies haphazard or by geographical location. The captain in command of Company D, with a small percentage of A and B men, and a large fraction of illiterate and foreign-born soldiers, was expected to train his men and get them ready for France at the same time that the captain of Company E got his men ready, and yet the captain of Company E had a large percentage of men who, as far as intelligence was concerned, were officer material, and he had only a small proportion of the illiterate or foreign. College instructors sometimes face a similar situation of inequality in their classes, having to cover the ground in the same length of time that other instructors do who have very different material to work with. Among 15,385 officers, whose intelligence scores here are tabulated, only one made a rating as low as D. 84.1% of the 15,385 officers sampling made ratings of A or B, a proportion quite similar to the proportion of college students with A or B mentality as measured by the same tests. During the past four years, the Carnegie Institute of Technology has been developing utilizing the group method of examining students. There has been a gradual evolution of these tests, in which several progressive stages are to be noted. First, a number of different kinds of tests that seem promising are given to a large group of students, and the results for each test are plotted in the form of a percentile graph. In the number completion test, for example, the scores made by the students are plotted against the percentages of students who attained each score. Such a graph is very convenient later on in making a comparison between the performance of any individual student and that of the large group as a whole. Knowing his score in the test, one can say instantly, by referring to the chart, that this student is superior to, say, 67% of his class. The next stage is to compare these test rankings with scholarship records and with estimates of the students' ability made by their instructors. These statistical comparisons show that some tests are much less indicative for success in college than others. Such tests are eliminated, and the following year new tests are tried in their place. When a student's score is obtained in several tests that have proven to be reliable, it is convenient to prepare a diagram that may be called his psychological profile. One student, for example, in the Margaret Morrison Division, the vocational college for women, ranked in the lowest 10% of her class in the opposites test, in the lowest 8% in the analogies test, in the lowest 5% in the completion test, and so on. Her psychological profile chart shows at a glance that in only one test did she do better than the lowest 25%. That student was soon dropped for poor scholarship. The average faculty estimate of her ability placed her very near the bottom. It was 1.67 on a scale of 10. The faculty estimate, made after three months' acquaintance with the student, agrees with the psychological test made on the day of entrance. 
The mental profile of another student, instead of running near the bottom of the chart, is almost entirely in the upper half, showing instantly that in nearly all the tests she excels the majority of her classmates. She is, as a matter of fact, a good student, the faculty estimate on her ability being 9.8 on a scale of 10. By such means as these, the Institute has tried to make the information regarding the intelligence test records of its students conveniently available to the administrative officers. It has also endeavoured to improve the tests year by year. The work is under the immediate direction of Professor L. L. Thurstone. He has recently combined the results of previous experience into a new group test in two parts. Each part requires less than half an hour to give. It is called the Cycle Omnibus Test. Omnibus because it includes in one test several forms of tasks, such as making true and false statements, analogies, opposites, proverbs of similar meaning, etc., and cycle, because these varied forms of tasks are presented in succession repeatedly. The forms of tasks selected for this cycle omnibus test are those which have already proven their worth as indicators of the ability of students to do college work satisfactorily. It is interesting to make a comparison between the reliability of psychological tests and other means ordinarily employed for predicting success or failure of college students, such as college entrance examination grades, high school records and the like. Three of the best criteria of success that are employed in the college entrance procedure of the engineering school are the entrance examination in algebra, the dean's interview rating, and the rating given by the high school principal based upon the boy's performance in the high school. Combining those three criteria and using them for prediction of the student's success, it is found that they correlate about 0 0.40 with instructors' estimates made after the students have been known to them for one semester. That correlation is somewhat higher than college entrance examinations taken alone ordinarily give. I do not know just what the results have been with the college entrance examination board examinations of the past years. When Thorndike some years ago computed the correlation between college entrance examinations at Columbia and the student scholarship standing in the college, he found practically zero correlation. In other words, the student's performance in the entrance examination was no prediction whatever of the degree of his success with his college studies. When we used last year as a basis of prediction for the engineering students, three of the dozen or so tests that we have been working with at Carnegie the correlation with instructors' estimates was 0.48. It was somewhat better than when the combined high school record, algebra examination and dean's interview rating were used. But here is a significant point if we combine the information from those sources with the test scores. The coefficient of correlation is raised to nearly 0.57. We get a more reliable prediction by using both the old criteria and the new criteria in combination. Information obtained by such psychological methods will undoubtedly have its value in connection with problems of admission to college. This question of admission is one that suggests desirability of making improvements in two directions. Is it not possible to admit a larger number of students who are now excluded but who could profit by the college course? Is it not possible to exclude from college a larger proportion of the students who now come to college and fail, who leave with the brand of failure upon them, having wasted their own time and their father's money. The use of psychological methods ought to help in solving both of these problems. It should make possible more elasticity in the administration of entrance requirements. In the state universities and middle western colleges, there is enormous mortality in the freshman year. Perhaps that is the way it ought to be. We ought to give everybody an opportunity who can possibly make good in college, but at the same time we ought to make more of an effort to exclude those who, even though they may be high school graduates, cannot possibly succeed in college, and direct them towards a type of training that they could really profit by. How is one to suggest wisely the direction in which a student, not able to take college training, should turn? Can mental tests be of any assistance whatever in specific vocational guidance? At some far distant date, psychological methods are going to be a help even in this difficult task of guidance. They cannot help today. I mean that there exists now no adequate psychological test of specialised vocational talent. One strike exception to that generalisation is Seashore's test for the measurement of musical talent. But in general, psychology has very, very little to offer in the way of specialised tests of ability in different vocations. Mental tests are, however, tools of some reliability in determining general intelligence. In ascertaining the level of a person's ability to learn to profit by experience and to adapt himself to changing demands, 
These tests are not 100% perfect, but they are reliable up to a certain point, and to that extent, I am confident they are going to find a useful place in university administration, not only with reference to the administration of admissions, but also in the guidance of students and the problems they face throughout their academic career. In conclusion, let me offer one word of caution against encouraging the adoption of psychological methods unless faculty and administration are quite ready to cooperate in checking up the results and in putting them to use. The group examinations should be followed up by more detailed individual examinations of students who make a poor score. Individual examinations should also be made of students who are known to be on the verge of failure in their work to ascertain definitely whether their poor showing is due to lack of native ability. All this work takes a great deal of time and should not be required of psychology instructors who are already carrying full schedules of teaching. Any thoroughgoing program for the use of the psychological methods in university administration should include provision of time and funds for an additional specialist in individual psychology and mental measurement. The suggestions contained in the above results of mental tests are of considerable importance in the systematic study of college personnel. The demonstrated value of the work of the Committee on Classification of Personnel in the Army and of the Division of Psychology of the Surgeon General's Office should not be lost. The suggestions for systematic study and cooperation research contained in an article recently published by one of the editors of this volume seem pertinent here. The dignity of the study of human qualities is worthy of still more pretentious plan. Personal classification in the formation of the United States Army brought into high relief certain difficulties that institutions dealing with the training and education of young men and women have vaguely felt. A few institutions had attempted to set into operation methods aimed at the solution of these questions. The systematic and persistent exploration of the difficulties in their solution were forced upon the War Department. Its rapid and unprecedented expansion gave clear definition of many unsettled personal problems. It found the source of supply unanalyzed and its own needs but vaguely in mind. Large numbers of specialists were suddenly demanded. Experience quickly demonstrated that personal qualities were extremely important assets in war. It became necessary to specify in detail the personal, educational and technical requirements for each important task. To ensure proper qualifications, specially devised tests proved necessary. The increased size of the army forced it to maintain complete and detailed systems of personal records and to devise special follow-up methods. Army experience can be duplicated in the experience of our educational institutions. We believe that the pressure of war has produced a clearer conception of the problems involved in training and placement. It has emphasized the advantages of carefully systematized procedure in discovering needed qualifications of human nature and the importance of freeing estimates of persons as, as much as possible from the errors of personal bias and incidental acquaintance. Vague memories of so-and-so's personality and qualifications broke down utterly as a means of building up an army. This article proposes the general outline of a plan for a personnel bureau. The principal features of such a bureau can be put into operation in any educational institution, large or small. The plan considers the study of student personnel as fundamental in any institution that believes its function connected in any way with the well-being of its patrons and with the success of its graduates in their chosen professions. It also contains the implication that such an institution must keep fuller and more definite records of success and failure of personalities and the results of its training and teaching. The essential functions of such a bureau or committee are four. Modifications of the plan will emphasize one or the other of these functions according to local conditions, the specific aims of the institution or the personnel of the bureau itself. Subdivisions of functions will increase with the growth of the bureau and the financial and moral encouragement given it. The primary functions of the bureau are to obtain accurate data on each student, to codify the requirements of different professions, to supervise use of tests and to provide means whereby each student may become acquainted with his abilities and the requirements of the occupations in which he is interested. Properly to perform these functions as complete an inventory of the human material passing through the institution as is possible must be made in permanent form. Second, the files of this bureau must contain a similar inventory of the important vocations. Third, the bureau will provide the responsible agencies for bringing to the student seeking a life occupation all its systematic material on the opportunities and requirements necessary to attain a certain degree of success in those vocations open to him. Fourth, the bureau will proceed 
on the assumption that all these problems can be investigated in a scientific manner and will initiate and encourage research in this field. The essentials of the inventory of human material can be placed on a single card. The personal history card or qualification card. This qualification card will contain facts concerning the previous history of the individual. This previous history should contain items concerning his social and school life pertinent to the response of such an inventory. The card will also be a permanent record of his educational career. It is not necessary to summarize in detail the items involved in such a record. Ratings which will consist of elementary school grades, marks in college or technical schools studied and the results of specially devised rating plans will also be recorded on this card. It is further expected that on the student's qualification card, space be left for recording the results of intelligence tests and of other tests important in determining the qualifications of the individual. Recent determinations of the usefulness of such intelligence ratings and specialised tests make it probable that in the future no institution will be without such information concerning its student body. The information desired as a part of the student's permanent record may be attained in several well-known ways. Though at present, none of these is satisfactory. Extremely valuable estimates of the individual's qualifications and qualities of mind and person may nevertheless be obtained by careful interviewing when he reports for entrance to the college or other educational institution. Such estimates as a student himself gives at his interview can be supplemented and checked by carefully preparing letters of inquiry to persons who have known him in his previous school work and outside activities. Additional ratings and estimates on personal qualities and on special aptitudes should be obtained at least yearly from his instructors and fellow students. These estimates properly tabulated and combined with the objective ratings obtained from the tests give the foundation for tentative judgments of the student's ability and the probable future career. The second function of this bureau is a collection and classification of vocational information. This should include carefully obtained opinions on the qualities necessary for success in each of the vocations studied. Each vocation should be carefully studied from the point of view of the range of mental capacity that will stand a satisfactory chance for success. A card for a vocation should also indicate minimum and maximum educational qualifications so far as they can be returned. Such a request must also specify the need for any special ability if such is an essential. When properly completed, the specifications for any vocation will also include a statement of the more essential qualities necessary for success in that vocation. It is not too much to believe that sometime in the future these may be given their proper weighting in a great many vocations. Bibliographies pertaining to special fields can also be made available to students through the Bureau. Again, much careful investigation is necessary. This part of the work of the Bureau must begin at the beginning. The utter lack of agreement on the qualities that produce success and satisfaction in life is easily demonstrated. Whether this failure to agree is a matter of permanent differences indicating many roads to success or satisfaction, or is rather one in which a limited number of qualities receive different weights under definitely desirable conditions, is surely a problem worth experimentation. Minimal requirements of education and training can undoubtedly be specified and standardised. The third important function of this personal bureau will be to bring to the students seeking a life vocation all material collected on vocations. By proper methods of cataloguing this material can be readily presented to the student. In this conference section of the bureau, problems concerning his college advancement may also be taken up with the student. It is, of course, here that the importance of the objective tests can most readily be seen. The collection and recording of the information as described above will be of extreme advantage to the dean and to others whose duty it is to discuss with the student his place in the school, work and his success in advancing studies. Properly, to develop the fourth function, it is important that a single responsible agency have charge of general intelligence tests and other forms of testing used. This agency should not be within any single school or department of the institution. The value of modern group and individual examinations of relative intelligence is now thoroughly established. The plan proposes aims to make these an integral part of the personal inventory. The satisfactory development of their values rests on the scientific care and common sense skill with which they are used. Their proper use is obviously in connection with the two inventories above described. 
so used they will undoubtedly prove invaluable aids in personal interviews with students the importance of following up the use of tests is of course patent the correlations desired are essential in estimating the significance of tests the prophetic value of personal data and the weightings for vocational qualifications constant revision retrial and experimentation are employed in this fourth function of the bureau the personnel of such a bureau should be carefully selected during the first years of its operation and in preparing the final form of organization its work should be supervised by a general committee immediate responsibility for the bureau should be in hands of a smaller group of men who have shown themselves to be particularly interested in human qualities and their development if properly managed it will require part-time form at least three men of professional rank the chairman of this smaller group should be responsible for the general organization of the plan and its coordination with other university activities the second member of the subcommittee should be a specialist who is thoroughly acquainted with business methods and vocational specifications the third member should have special qualities fitting him for personal contact with the student and for the unbiased presentation of the requirements of different vocations the direct management of the affairs of the bureau should be in the hands of a secretary should have at least the rank of an assistant professor it is probable that practically full time will be required of this man and in the current management of such a bureau he doubtless will be the important active member of it the proposed bureau does not present a scheme for vocational guidance if an institution or a dean feels that it or he can probably carry the responsibility the bureau provides the only safe procedure for obtaining guidance in passing out such advice we believe rather that an institution owes to its student body to provide systematically prepared information about life and its business further if the study of human qualities is to be removed from the realm of palmistry and get rich quick schemes systemized research must provide the means persistent and organized research of this type must be done in permanent institutions that will provide continuous and accessible records several years of cooperative research among widely distributed institutions might even produce principles for vocational guidance end of chapter four of army mental tests Chapter 5 of Army Mental Tests, compiled and edited by Clarence S. Yoakum and Robert M. Yerkes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 5. Practical Applications. In an address to the personal officer's school at Camp Meigs less than a year ago, Major General Hutchinson, CBDSO, Director of Organization of the British Army, spoke very frankly of the serious mistake of Great Britain in recruiting her skilled labor indiscriminately into fighting units. They made good soldiers, but the plan seriously interfered with the development of tentacle units and the output of many vital things. No one has computed the cost of bringing back those skilled men from the Western Front after they had been trained as soldiers, or of having the vital things made elsewhere that might have been made at home. If it had not been for the great American reservoir of skilled labor, it would probably have cost the war. That the United States did not make a similar, and with the exhaustion of the reservoir, a disastrous mistake in the military distribution of our skilled labor is due primarily to the Committee on the Classification of Personnel in the Army. The work of this committee is commonly regarded as one of the great contributions of civilians to the efficiency of the Army. It is probably the greatest single piece of mental engineering that has ever been attempted in this country but it is by no means the only task of the war that was successfully met by an application of the principles of the sciences of human behavior in war conditions mental engineering as an organized war service of american psychologists began at an informal meeting of experimentalists in the spring of nineteen seventeen they asked themselves the universal question what they could do to help win the war the answer to that question as it finally evolved has come to be more than a matter of historic interest more than a war measure, more than practical applications of a single science. It is a permanent contribution to the organization and utilization of human forces. It inevitably projects itself into the great reconstruction and supplies at once a prophecy and an obligation. The work of the Committee on the Psychological Examination of Recruits was another of the notable mental engineering achievements of the war. 
Its original purpose was to help to eliminate from the army, at the earliest possible moment, those recruits whose defective intelligence would make them a menace to the military organization. But the military value of an early and reliable estimate of the general intelligence of each recruit proved enormously greater than had been anticipated. But in the enormous task of building up an efficient army organization, it proved important to discover at the earliest opportunity those recruits who could learn the new duties that were required of them as soldiers in the shortest time. To train the quick learners and the slow learners together in the same companies was an intolerably wasteful process. Moreover, the army needed an enormous number of men with superior intelligence for officers. While the higher general intelligence did not guarantee good officer material, it was a conspicuous fact that good officers regularly ranked high in the intelligence tests. In the selection of men for officer training camps, mental tests were obviously preferable to the importunity of influential friends. They proved greatly superior to personal impressions. Necessity of a scientific basis. For a variety of reasons, mental testing has aroused an unusually widespread popular interest. It was initiated and first developed in France as a scientific instrument for educators. It has become an important adjunct to the juvenile court and bids fair to become a valuable instrument for social research and a practical device for solving a considerable number of perplexing educational and industrial problems. For example, the various trades represented in the draft made rather insistent demands not only on physical strength and endurance but also on the ability to make new and complex situations which we call general intelligence. We commonly deplore spoiling a first-class mechanic to make a poor executive. Apparently, the scientific measurement of general intelligence will go a long way in estimating whether a person has the general intelligence that is required for average success in any given trade or profession. But it is easily possible to expect too much of mental tests. Prophecy of a future is vastly more difficult than a record of actual developments, even in such relatively simple matters as the weather. The only final indicator of the inability of a person to succeed in a profession is failure, and even a failure may be the one factor in the complex conditions of the mental life that is necessary for success. In view of the suddenly developed popular interest in mental tests, it is necessary to point out that no so-called mental test is of the least scientific value unless it rests on a scientific analysis of the process to be tested and unless it has been thoroughly systematized and statistically evaluated. The preparation of the army tests of general intelligence was a notable technical achievement of far-reaching importance. Lieutenant Commander Dodge gives in the succeeding paragraph an illustration of the steps necessary to the analysis of an interesting psychological problem and to the preparation of practical methods of using the solution when obtained. The brilliantly successful solution of this problem is due primarily to his skill and insight. The first problem that was referred to the subcommittee on vision was the question whether we had any way of selecting those naval recruits who could be trained most quickly as gun pointers for the armed merchant ships. The next step was to learn exactly what a gun pointer had to do. The next was to reduce the more or less complicated process of gun pointing to their simplest neuromuscular terms. It was a definite problem for analysis and because of the perfect systemization, the high specialization of naval tasks, it was relatively simple. The third step was to adapt approved scientific techniques to the study of this particular complex of neuromuscular processes. For this purpose, an instrument was devised that would show all the following facts on a single record line. 1. The time it took a sailor to start his gun-pointing reaction after the target at which he was aiming started to move. 2. The accuracy with which he was able to keep on the moving target. 3. Time that it took him to respond to a change in the direction of motion of the target. 4. The ability to press the firing key when he was on. 5. The effect of firing on his pointing. All these data were so simplified they could be accurately estimated from simple measurements of a single line without elaborate computations. A succession of records indicated the probable quickness with which the sailor would learn the new conditions. The final step was to test the probably military value of our instrument and its records by performance of expert and inexpert gun pointers. The first trials proved the usefulness of the device. It clearly differentiated between the qualified gun pointers, the partially trained and the untrained. It picked a number of promising officers, indicated the faults of some who were slow to improve. Predictions based on the records were uniformly corroborated by subsequent experience. Somewhat later, it was possible to construct a robust training instrument along similar lines that was rather enthusiastically reported on by various naval officers, 
and was widely reproduced by the Navy for use in the naval training stations. After a time when every available gun was needed for service afloat, the utility of our relatively simple and inexperienced training instrument that closely reproduced the coordinates of actual service needs no emphasis. The emphasis Lieutenant Commander Dodge places on the necessity for thorough systemization, analysis, and statistical evaluation is timely. The spread of the use of the Army intelligence tests and the numerous requests for data regarding them make an emphatic reiteration of this caution extremely important. Army tests were prepared for a specific purpose. The successful recruits obtained were due in large measure to the strict limitations of use to that purpose. Any educational, social, or industrial applications the test may have must necessarily be less successful in that degree in which the aim and the groups tested differ from the selected group reporting to the great cantonments to be trained as soldiers. New standards for these tests must be formulated. New tests will need to be devised in many instances, especially will it be necessary to reinterpret results and establish new critical points in the scale. Educational Applications The group method of examining school children for general intelligence is already in use. It is proving important as a method of making rapid school surveys for states and cities. Within these units, it enables school principals to make frequent surveys of classrooms in order to discover promptly pupils who are retarded or who are being held in grades too easy for their ability. These rapid surveys indicate quickly and with a high degree of accuracy the students who need special attention. They point out those cases that need more careful individual examination and give standards of measurement that possess a much greater degree of reliability than have those used heretofore. A very respectable list of group tests for school purposes is available today. Some of these are adaptations of the army tests. One from which extremely interesting results may be expected is being used in the Virginia School Survey. School surveys are in progress in other states using the army intelligence test in the form described in this book. Other group tests in use are, to greater or less degree, divergent in content but utilize the principles described above in chapter 2 under the direction of the national research council a group test especially planned for school children is now being prepared a study of the army tests in the selection and rating of elementary and high school teachers is in progress correlation coefficients for the army alpha tests and other measurements of intelligence were presented on page 20 an especially severe test of the Army Intelligence Tests is shown there in the correlation of school grade location of 13 and 14 year old pupils. The coefficients of correlation range from 0.75 to 0.91. Numerous factors work against such high correlations. For example, the tendency of schools to try the backward pupils in advanced grades regardless of attainment. The large numbers of those who, discouraged by being forced to remain in classes with pupils much younger, then they, or by the difficulty of the work, drop out of school entirely. And also the chance that brighter pupils leave because of youthfulness are held back and forced to go more slowly than their ability warrants. Two of these factors tend to displace correct grade location. The other materially reduces the probable range and thereby tends to lower correlations. In spite of these factors, high correlations are shown. The following table gives the distribution for 139 school children who took Examination A. This is the first army form of the examination for literates. A table is given here as a sample of results obtained in preparing for the revision of this examination which resulted in alpha. No alpha results other than correlations are quoted. No school should expect exactly similar scatter tables. The correlation here is 0.821. Table 12 is displayed on the page, with a series of columns descending with grade scores. The beta test, the army group test for literates and foreigners, has also been used in testing school children. Cases numbering 597 representing all grades give the correlations age with score 0.76, school grade with score 0.85. One feature of the new test now being developed is that the characteristics of the alpha and beta tests are combined in a single scale. At the close of active psychological work in the Army, such a combined test was almost completed for Army use. A plan for the specific experimental use of intelligence tests in the schools was presented by Major Yerkes in his Harvey lecture cited above. It is in line with results obtained by similar experiments in the Army. From leaders in our school systems, 
from administrative officers and teachers in colleges and professional schools and from specialists in educational psychology come requests for permission to use the army mental tests it is a hope of many of these men that mental ratings as soon as it is made possible to secure them conveniently and reliably may be used in our public schools as partial basis for grading promotion and vocational advice that they should prove valuable also in institutions of higher learning as partial basis for administration classification grading promotion assignment to special work and vocational guidance such applications of mental measurement would it is true radically change our educational system for at present mental achievement the extent of information or the lack of it is virtually the sole basis for admission classification and promotion mental measurement of school pupils college and professional students indicate extreme differences in mental ability throughout the educational range as well as important differences in the mental constitution these facts must be taken into account if educational procedure is to benefit the individual in the highest degree it therefore is proposed that children should be classified in accordance with mental ability either as they enter school or shortly thereafter and that mental ability should thereafter be taken into account in connection with their educational treatment the following plan is therefore proposed as a means of utilizing mental ratings in the interests alike of education and of vocational placement on the basis of reliable mental ratings children should be classified in one of three intellectual groups which may be professions so called pupils of grade c should by contrast follow a manual training course as a means of continuing to its limit their intellectual development and simultaneously fitting themselves for the most appropriate type of vocational activity mental classification and educational treatment in accordance with the same although seemingly undemocratic is quite the reverse while boasting of equality of opportunity in our national life and particularly in our educational system we are as a matter of fact seriously discriminating against individuals because of our failure to take their characteristics and needs into account equality of opportunity in our schools necessitates classification in accordance with ability individualized treatment recognition of limitations and of practical limits of educability differentiation of courses and vocational direction and training which shall enable the individual to avoid failure by reason of undertaking the impossible or waste because of the choice of an occupation which makes slight demand upon the ability of the individual social significance the army data on racial differences are meagre the introduction and development of the group tests and the invention of successful individual and group methods for testing the illiterate and non-english speaking will now make it feasible to carry out experiments in mental testing that have previously been impossible it seems within the bounds of reason to prophesy the development of methods that will finally aid in defining racial and environmental likenesses and differences for the present two or three steps of social significance are indicated the problem of illiteracy has been emphasized by the recruiting of the draft army attention has been focused on this great educational problem by the facts brought out by the army's attempt to instruct the draft psychological methods have aided in the discovery of those unable to learn and the classification according to literacy the group method of examining checked up later by individual examination for failures throws each man on his own resources it establishes a check on progress after leaving school and by careful use will shortly enable us to standardize a practical definition of illiteracy or literacy many men in the army reporting fourth and fifth grade schooling proved unable to make scores in the army test for literates alpha because they could no longer read in anything but a halting manner and because the simple arithmetic problems carried no meaning many of these write letters with frequent misspelled words and no longer read more than a few of the headlines in newspapers the general intelligence examination offers an objective standardized test both in the schoolroom and without to measure actual ability in mastery of these important social tools the discovery of the semi-literate is a secondary use of the group test its correlation with school grade is high and the results in the previous grades are therefore excellent indications of success in the mastery of the necessary elementary equipment of a citizen interrelations of illiteracy crime prostitution poverty mental disease and mental deficiency are by no means clear the methods of investigation are in their infancy means of measuring degrees of importance of this or that factor are still primitive the very definition of the traits that may or may not be responsible for the social results enumerated is still to be accomplished specific delimitation 
and formulation of these problems are much needed. In lieu of something better, the army methods of testing intelligence were used to assist if possible in the solution of these pressing problems. The question of discipline is extremely important to the morale and efficiency of an army. It seemed probable that one of the causes of crimes in the army is the lack of a sense of responsibility due to feeble-mindedness. Many summary court cases were first tested by the army psychologists. They were called in to testify in numerous other instances. Minor breaches of discipline were frequently reported to the psychologists for examination and recommendation. It was not an unusual sight in the camps to see a soldier under guard in a psychological building awaiting mental examination. A complete survey of the disciplinary barracks at 4th Leavenworth was made shortly after the armistice. The details of the study cannot be reported here. On the whole, the group averaged in mental ability the equivalent of the entire draft. The range of intelligence was approximately the same. Certain differences in mental capacity were apparently related to crimes of special sorts. Desertion correlated positively with low mentality, though the correspondence was not high. The actual percentage of low-grade mental cases increased with certain other army offences. The preliminary nature of the study makes it unwise to quote extensively from the report. The army tests have recently been used in surveys of state reformatories and state prisons. The argument states that the transfer of the mentally deficient to state institutions for the feeble-minded and defectives would relieve the prisons of persons who do not properly belong there, would reduce the expense of their care, and place them where they would not be turned loose again in a society where they cannot protect themselves. Thus, a necessary first step would be taken in the solution of causes of crime by the classification of these men and women on the basis of intelligence. The evidence so far does not indicate that the problem is solved by this classification. On the contrary, it indicates rather definitely that other causes or facilitating conditions are largely responsible. The negative character of the evidence is important. Where a positive correspondence of crime with feeble minors exists, we can proceed at once with segregation. Classification by such progressive steps becomes easier as one after another of the causes are uncovered and removed. The significance of mental tests is greater in the cases of prostitution studied. In several hundred cases investigated by the psychologists, 53% of women were 10 years mental age or less. 10% were so feeble-minded that they should have been placed in custodial institutions. These results correspond to previous results obtained in many parts of the country. A large percentage of those who tested above 10 mentally showed marked evidence of mental instability and in some instances, definite mental disease. A relatively small number could be said to be mentally normal. Studies of conscientious objectors by means of the psychological examination showed that they averaged slightly higher as a group than the draft. A few were foreign-born, but the cause evidently must be sought elsewhere than in either of these conditions. A clannish nature of the groups that furnished the majority of the conscientious objectors has been suggested as a condition underlying their failure to appreciate the aims and ideals of a great mass of men and women. Whatever the cause or condition, it is not simply to lie in any difference of general mental ability. Again, the evidence is negative, but one of the most common explanations, ignorance as evidence in lack of mental capacity, can no longer be offered. Industrial Applications The following discussion is quoted in the main from a manuscript by Major Yerkes. The convincing demonstration of the practicability of mental measurement in connection with placement is one of the conspicuously important contributions of psychological service to the army. It is generally admitted by those who have taken the trouble to consider the matter that the methods prepared to meet military needs have wide applicability and possibly of indefinitely increasing value. Within the army, experienced officers as well as men now in the service recognize that the utilization of mental ratings has increased efficiency by improving placement and facilitating elimination. Psychological service has suddenly created a large demand for technological work. This demand is most insistent from education and industry, although the sciences also are making their needs known. Before the war, mental engineering was a dream. Today it exists, and its effective development is amply assured. The relation of intelligence to occupation as studied in the army is of very obvious importance for education and for industry. Figure 24 presents the proportion of three chief groups of intelligence ratings for a number of army occupations. The data are not comparable with those which would be obtained from civilian groups because of various selectional factors which appear in the army. 
In order of diminishing intelligence, the occupational groups represented in Figure 24 may be classified thus. Professions, clerical occupations, trades, partially skilled labor and unskilled labor. The greatest differences in intelligence required or exhibited by different occupations appear at the ends of the scale, whereas differences in the trained group are relatively slight. Further differences in range of intelligence for the various occupations are considerable and probably significant. The range in general diminishes from unskilled labor to the intellectually difficult professions for the obvious reason that whereas any individual may attempt tasks which require relatively little intelligence or education, only able individuals can succeed in the learned professions. It is well worthy of remark that whereas a group of army laborers contains a few individuals of high and grade intelligence, A or B ratings, the group of engineering officers contains very few except high grade individuals. Figure 25 presents the relation of intelligence to occupation for a similar group of army occupations in a quite different manner. Figure 24 is displayed on the page. Figure 24, Occupational Intelligence Standards, based on data for 18,423 men. Data taken from soldiers' qualification cards. Length of bar shows range of middle 50%. Vertical cross bar shows position of median. The data sampled by Figure 24 and 25 suggest both the possibility and desirability of securing intelligence specifications for use in education and industry. Such specifications, if satisfactorily prepared, should greatly assist teachers in advising and directing pupils in accordance, for example, with some such plan of educational organization as has been suggested above. They should also prove of value in connection with industrial placement. Figure 25 is displayed on the page. Relation of occupation to intelligence in the army. Within the industrial sphere, as contrasted with educational, intelligent employment management requires abundant information and the development and use of scientific methods. Individuals, if hired and placed at random, seldom hold their jobs for more than a few days. The enormous labour turnover of many industrial concerns is due chiefly to three causes. A. The relatively unfitness by nature or training of the individual for the work assigned, b. Unsatisfactory conditions of labour, and c. The mechanisation and the resulting dehumanising of industrial processes. For wise and effective industrial placement and occupational guidance, two things at least are absolutely essential. First, definite knowledge of the physical and mental requirements, specification of the job, and second, equally definite knowledge of the physical and mental characteristics and capacities of the individual to be placed. If these requirements are to be met satisfactorily, occupations will have to be carefully analysed in their relations to the individual and definite specifications will have to be prepared. In addition, individuals will have to be classified in accordance with intelligence, temperament, education and occupational taste or preference. It is now possible to prepare specifications and suitably to classify individuals with reference to intelligence, education and occupational taste. For the present at least, it is probable that if three grades of intellect were distinguished in history, as has been suggested for the school, a very great gain would be made in degree of fitness of the individual for his task, and in his resulting content and efficiency. Concerning temperamental measurement and classification, there is little to say, for methods at once simple and reliable are not yet available. It is nevertheless obvious that temperament is as important as intelligence for industrial placement and vocational guidance. Despite the seemingly infinite variety of temperaments, there are probably just a few classes which have great occupational importance. It is possible, indeed, that even three classes, as in the case of intelligence, might suffice for immediate practical requirements. Could we but devise methods of measuring temperamental characteristics as satisfactorily as those now used for measuring intelligence? The concrete significance of general intelligence testing is difficult to describe. It is conceivable that some occupation will show a perfect degree of correspondence between score and success. If such an occupation were ever found, the application of the test to candidates for positions in that occupation would be seen to be the best measure possible. No one expects to find such an occupation. The correspondence between school success and the test is relatively high as shown above. Clerical workers succeed in general in proportion to score but many other factors are to be considered even in these cases of positive correlation. 
An illustration of a negative correlation or correspondence is given in the following table compiled from records of a group of machine operators. Here the correlation between production and the army test scores is 0 0.087. Distribution tables comparing score and errors and score and combined production and errors for this special group of operators give similar results. Two things are at once apparent. A number of girls are putting in their time on work at which they do not excel. Some of these have high intelligence scores. Some have extremely low scores, but neither group is producing results comparable with those of a third group of girls whose intelligence is nearer the average for the entire group. In the second place, the evidence points definitely to other factors than intelligence as important in determining the success of an operator. In this instance, the intelligence test may be said to have shown that certain girls are not doing work in which they excel. The problem of finding what they would excel in is, of course, untouched. The results also indicate the need for a more detailed analysis of the particular task. The list of cautions in the use of tests is already a long one but many more might be added. In this chapter, certain fields that are open and ready for the intensive labour that accompanies research have been described briefly. The most dangerous thing that can happen is to have education, economics, sociology and industry accept the results of mental tests uncritically and with haste for immediate service that does not permit careful study and additional research. The Army demonstration has proved conclusively the value of psychological investigations but it established another idea equally important, the value of group cooperation. The following quotation from Lieutenant Commander Dodge emphasizes this point. Table 13, Alpha Score, is displayed on the previous page. The following quotation from Lieutenant Commander Dodge emphasizes this point. Value of group cooperation. The list of incomplete services that were cut short of full fruition by the signing of the armistice would be too long to even mention here, though it would include some of the more difficult and important enterprises of psychological service. The most important facts that appeared in the war work of the psychologists were, first, the value of the applications of the principles of psychology to concrete military problems, and second, the importance of cooperation in practical scientific service. To the military tasks, the psychologists brought their appreciation of the distinctly human and mental aspects of the problems that were involved, their training in the technique of mental analysis, their laboratory methods for estimating human reactions, and their ingenuity in developing new instruments for special purposes. But in no case was the necessary skill and practical experience in the possession of any one person. The best work of the psychologist was a product of group cooperation for which the far-sighted guidance of the chairman, Major R. M. Yerkes, and his colleagues of the National Research Council was an important condition. Success in our undertakings would have been impossible without the will to cooperate with each other, with representatives of the other sciences, with employment managers, industrial and educational experts, as well as with officers of the Army and Navy. While it was not always easy to convince responsible persons that we could help, when they were once convinced the only limit to our service was the limit of human endurance. At the end of the war, avenues were opening for genuine cooperation in scientific matters between the various scientific bodies of the Allies. At the conclusion of our war work, two real dangers confront us, one military and the other social. The military danger is that, with the passing of the military crisis, we shall stop our study of the mental factors in war. If some other country with more permanent policies should take up the mental analysis where we have left them and develop a real military psychology, they would have a military instrument vastly more effective than 42 centimetre guns. But even if the efforts of our statesmen are successful and the war is forever abolished, the relative importance of psychological offensives will not be diminished. On the contrary, when mental weapons became the only legitimate means of securing national ends, they will become increasingly more important. Whether the reconstruction is military or non-military, the need of cooperative studies of vital mental problems and of cooperative efforts at scientific mental engineering will certainly not be less important for society than the scientific and engineering problems that concern material things. In view of these future needs, our wartime activities, however interesting and however successful, they may have been, seem relatively trivial and insignificant. End of chapter 5 End of Army Mental Tests by Robert Yerkes and Clarence Yoakum Recorded by Leon Harvey